can't say first we have because they're going to be simultaneous, but we've got the Minnesota Blizzard uh, versus the Reykjavik Puffins, 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 Puffins. And we've got the uh, Mumbai Movers against the San Francisco Mechanics. And uh, the Puffins uh, finished second or tied for first, really, in their um, in their division, losing on tie breaks. Is it fair to call that tie breaks? Yeah, I mean, the or... fan growth tie break played a really big factor in that group obviously bottom bottom wins that group because of the fan tie break but it was a difference of fewer than 50 fans so all those hardcore georg meyer fans they get to play now on august 30th while reykjavik has to play today and they have a really tough test they have to play against the, the minnesota blizzard who played yesterday and earned their spot as a second place team in group d yeah and the blizzard um have also been through the playoffs before in the main pro chess league season so it's a really um tough squad in general i think it's um you know, it's an extra match and an extra match against a good opponent. So. Yeah, and that's one of the hard parts about playing this extra round in the Summer Series playoffs. And one thing that I'm going to be looking for with the Reykjavik Puffins, this is their first ever playoff match, and this is their first 4v4 matchup since the 2018 regular season where they were relegated in the Central Division. The Reykjavik Puffins are going to be in the qualifiers this upcoming fall. You know, this is a great test for them. Minnesota is a very strong team, but they're beatable, right? I mean, they've got four 2,400 rated players. That means that all four of your your players that you have on your lineup have a really good shot at beating the Minnesota Blizzard. Uh, I'm going to be keeping an eye on all of their games today. Um, Mauricio Flores is going to be leading the Minnesota Blizzard, so that's going to be something that I want to be watching, especially as that match gets late. But our other match... You know, was decided you know last minute yesterday as a result of the third place fan vote. It's your San Francisco Mechanics against the Mumbai Movers, the first ever matchup between these two teams. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I think that it's very interesting to see what we'll get from Reykjavik, since as you said, they haven't played since two thousand eight. All four of their players today are players who did used to play for them, so they're not you know they're not inexperienced. It's just been just been a while since they've done it. Um, I think if they even win one match here in the first round against Minnesota, it shows that they could be ready to um, make it through the uh, qualifiers. Um, but if they lose in their first round, then, you know, then there's a big question mark over them going into the qualifiers. Right. And you and I raised uh, this question about the Reykjavik Puffins back when we were doing Group B coverage. Reykjavik was 1-15 in and the elite player, you know, component of their matches as they qualified. So for Reykjavik... They have to prove something today. I mean, we know that their fans are loyal. We know that they're going to turn out. But this, you know, the fans got them here. Now it's time for the players to deliver. And we're going to see what Reykjavik is made out of. You know, against a you know a team that probably could have been and could have found their way into the Pro Chess League semifinals in San Francisco, not just last year, but the last two years. Um, the San Francisco Mechanics, I, I see a lot of people in the chat wondering why it's 1-0 to zero already. There was a last-minute lineup change yeah. for the Mumbai Movers. Diptoyan Ghosh will be the board one for the Mumbai Movers. And because of the Pro Chess League rules, the match will start as a one nothing advantage for San Francisco. Now, with the seeding, you'll notice that Minnesota has a higher seed than Reykjavik. San Francisco has a higher seed than Mumbai. In the case of a tie these teams will move forward. And that's where that fan advantage really starts to creep in. And so for teams like Mumbai, who's already starting the match down one nothing before this thing even ticks off, they basically have to score nine points with four players. And I'm looking through their lineup right now. If we take a look through their lineup, they have Diptayan Ghosh, uh, uh, Harshit Raja, Kulkarni Rakesh, and Adi Aditya Mittal. And, you know, they've got some really talented board three and board four players. But when you're comparing to Sam Shanklin and Daniel Naraditsky, you've got to get points off of both of them if sam and daniel both go four out of four andrew and ladia yeah. can both go zero out of zero and san francisco will win the match and so i'm yeah. going to be looking for where does mumbai get those points i think it's going to be really critical for them as you know the match progresses i think gosh and, uh, and harshit both have to score points early if they want to stay in this yeah i think um i think when you're looking to get an upset like this where it starts is with your boards three and four trying to just get a draw off of the number one and number two. I don't know how deep you want it to go into like manager strategy right off the bat, everybody. But basically my take is, you know, if I did young Mittal, who's like 13 year old I am, just barely 13, right? Like if he can draw against Shanklin or Naroditsky, that can frustrate Shanklin or Naroditsky a little bit, make them feel like they're not invulnerable, like they're not going 4-0. And that then gives the opportunity later on for Harshit Raja or Deep Tayan Gosh to you know take a full point off of them right and i actually like that you brought up aditya Mittal there you know in the 2019 regular season he was rated about 2000 fide he has since gone from the candidate master title to the im title gained about 300 to 400 fide rating points he's actually higher rated right now than rakesh is 
on board yeah. three. And so that coaching student dynamic between board three and board four in Mumbai, if they can just sneak off a draw in the first two rounds against Shanklin or Naraditsky, that could turn this whole thing around. Yeah, I saw he gained over 200 rating points in January this year in one month, Isaac. He, um, he is quite so an impressive kid. Obviously insane. I think he made like, you know, like two IM norms that month or something like that. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe more. But, um, but, you know, with that huge K factor, sometimes you see someone gain like a large number of points, usually not 200 plus, <laughs> but a large number of points. And then in the month subsequent, like drop part of that, right? right. Like you go from 2220 to 2430. But it's like, well, you were really like 2350 and had a good month and you lose like 70, 80 points. But he's actually maintained that 2400 plus rating. So, I mean, he's just somebody to watch, period, in the world of chess, right? Is one of the most promising young players, period, anywhere. Right, and he's going to be tested immediately. His first game, he's going to have black, I believe, against Sam Shankland. And so that's going to really kind of give us an idea of where Vinny the Pooh is at DTM at all. You know, is you know, relative to the, the the opponents that he's playing against. For those of you guys who are active Chess.com blog reader, readers, he actually writes a regular blog here on Chess.com. You guys can go follow him. He's Vinny the Pooh. He'll pop up here when he plays Sam Shankland in any minute. Uh, so that's you know something to look forward to. Let's take a look at the bracket and try to figure out where these teams will end up should they win their matches today. Um, given yeah. that this is a 10-team bracket, that means that there is an extra round to today's playoffs. So should the San Francisco Mechanics or the Mumbai Movers you know, advance, they will play the one seed, the untested Sao Paulo Capybaras in you know a matchup that a lot of people are calling a dark horse friendly matchup. Sao Paulo's never played a pro chess league 4v4 match before. They did dominate during the pro chess league summer series, but this will be the test, I think, for either San Francisco or Mumbai, whoever moves forward today. On the other side, Reykjavik Puffins, Minnesota Blizzard, the winner with the winner will advance to play the Montreal Chess Bras, who dominated uh, this this summer's Pro Chess League Summer Series in Group D, finishing with 17 out of a possible 18 points. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously a tougher side of the bracket, right? I mean... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, with St. Louis, Chengdu, and Montreal all on the same side of the bracket, and throw in Minnesota, should they beat Reykjavik today, I mean, those are four teams yeah. that could all find their way into the Pro Chess League, um, you know, into yeah. the Pro Chess League uh, semifinals during the regular season. Now they're playing the quarterfinals on August 30th to try to move on to the semifinals of the Pro Chess League Summer Series. Um, you know, it's going to be really interesting, and we're going to learn a lot about those four teams as they head into the season. We'll also learn about the bottom, bottom snowballs as they take on the Moscow Wizards, who were a playoff team in the Eastern Division this past year, and Sao Paulo Capybaras. They will be playing in the qualifier. We'll see on August 30th how they do there. So let's take a look at what these teams are playing for before these matches get started. Um, they have gotten started, just so you know. Okay, well, we will <laughs> we we will switch to that uh, immediately, but the. The teams today are playing for $250 should they advance. And then with every round that they move forward, they win you know, more and more money. So for them, this is a great chance for them to pad their pockets, get ready for the, 2000, um, the 2019 regular season, and then go from there. So let's take a look at the, the game that we are most excited about so far today, and that will be the Sam Shankland game against Aditya Mittal. Uh, I think this is the test. I, you know, when I saw the lineups when they first came out before Mumbai had to make a change, I thought that Mumbai would have a really good shot at winning if, you know, Aditya could get two, two and a half maybe out of four. Um, and that's what I'll be looking for today. Unfortunately, now that they need nine points, they're going to need him to get two and a half or, you know, two out of four. And then they're board three and board two to really deliver. Yeah, um, Sam Shanklin and Daniel Naritsky have white in this first round against the boards um, three and four. And on the other side, um, you know, Raj, Raja and um, and uh, Ghosh have white against the boards three and four of San Francisco. Right. And so we've got a lot of different interesting matches. Um, which one do you want to start with? They all actually are pretty combative out of the opening. Yeah, I mean, to me, the most interesting place to start right away is Naraditsky Rakesh because um, it's just such a different position than what you normally see. Um, both Naraditsky and Shanklin sort of playing a similar opening actually this round. But if you look at Naraditsky's opening, I guess it's like the old school definition of hyper modern, right? Where he lets Rakesh put three pawns in the center by move five. Um, at no development cost for Rakesh. You know, he's not behind in development or anything, right? Right. Um, he's just got all that space. And, uh, you know, the bishop on f1 still needs a pawn to move to get out. 
So it's very unusual. Basically, if white has an advantage here, it's based on this bishop on b2 being sort of very, very hard to block, right? And somehow Daniel trying to say this white, that this black center, I almost said white center there, right? <laughs> this black center is somehow overextended, sort of the classical hypermodern thing, like, hey, your center is big, but it's not stifling my pieces, and I'm just going to take it apart and attack it. Um, and then he goes and trades another piece because, frankly, he doesn't have that much space and engages with the pawn on e4. So the question is, there's like two main kinds of pawn structures that it looks like we could get in this um, game. One would be the two d pawns get traded on e4. So you get sort of a symmetrical position with the d file open. And the other possibility is at some point black plays e takes d3, white plays c takes d3. And we get that position where white has the c file, black has the e file, sort of half open files. So um, basically we have to evaluate those two structures to sort of see how we think the position is. And in both of those structures, I, I'm tempted to say that white actually looks a touch better, actually. Yeah, and I actually um, have to agree with you there. I mean, this tension, I think, between the D3 pawn and the E4 pawn, I think is paramount to kind of the continuation of the rest of the game. Uh, you know, one thing I'm worried about if I'm Rakesh is, you know, how are you planning on recapturing after D takes E4? If black plays D takes E4 in response, that C4 square becomes a little bit weak. The bishop on B2 is opened up. You're opening up the D file. And that black king is still, you know, it hasn't castled. White's king is going to castle immediately. And, you know, I think we're really starting to see, like, the hyper-modern, you know, strategy kind of play out here, you know, given, you know, the limitations of Black's development, right? I mean, knight c4 or, you know, queen e2, knight c4 and put a rook on d1, you know, something of this nature, I think, is going to give White that edge that he's looking for when you play an opening like the Larsons. Yeah. Interesting to see Danya make that decision to open the d file right away. Because I thought that the E takes D3, C takes D3 position was pretty good for him too. So it felt like he had the choice to leave the tension a bit if he wanted to. Um, but uh, yeah, here, uh, here he chose to do that right away and clarify things. Maybe that means that Danya really likes this particular position here. Um, Potentially. I mean, I think one thing I was looking at back in this position is, you know, if white, let's just say, plays the move castles here and allows black to go, you know, to give white the hedgehog structure, white does not have the light squared bishop, which means one of the usual plans of, you know, if your bishop's on e2 playing rook, f, rook on f to e1, bishop f1, g3, and bishop g2 is not really available for white. And so that might make it easier for Rakesh to get counterplay. And while this is objectively fine for white, maybe his strategy here is I would rather put the lower rated player in a position that he might not be familiar with by taking on e4 and, uh -huh. you know, not give him the, you know, the, the pretty simple attacking resources. Remember, this is a rapid game. And so, you know, Rakesh, who is, you know, known to be someone who goes to sub Saturday and beats players like MVL, beats players, you know, who, who show up like uh, Ruslan Ponomaryev, I believe, um, you know, you don't want to give them free plans, right? And that's going to be key, I think, if Naroditsky wants to, you know, continue to build an advantage, but also muddy the waters. Yeah. Um, let's see. So I'm going to try and pop up a couple more games here from the other matches. So I've got everything watched. And I think one game that's actually blowing up that should, you know, require immediate attention is actually the game between uh, Raja Harshit and um, Andrew uh, Andrew Zhang, I believe, right? Andrew Hong. Andrew Hong. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. Um, it's okay. His middle name is Jang. So if you put Jang and Hong together, you get Zhang. Yeah, that's yeah, that's what I was. <laughs> sorry, um, but this is a really interesting position because neither king is castled. You know, both kings are weak. White just yeah. played this move f4, and right. The question is still who's in the driver's seat here. Right. I mean, it looks like Black's going to lose the e5 pawn. But black may still have some significant resources here as well, because depending on how or whether white castles, it may not be great to win the e5 pawn, right? Like if white wins the e5 pawn while black gets castled first, then the resulting position might not be good at all. Um, and I don't know if black wants to play rook c8, bishop c5, or castles queenside here. Um, those all sort of pop up as uh, reasonable candidate moves. I think... Maybe bishop c5 could be well answered by castling queenside. Right, and that's actually what I was trying to figure out here as well. I mean, if, if I'm playing with the black pieces, I'm trying to figure out how do I get my king to safety first? Because whoever gets their king safest 
first is likely going to have that advantage leaving the opening. And a lot of that stems for black from this bishop on f8. You know, you're going to be boxed in if you put it anywhere on e7 or in d6 because of the pawn structure that you have here from g7 to e5. And so with this move c3, you can't play bishop b4 either. So you have to find a way to make this move bishop to c5 work. I like a little bit of the creativity yeah. here with this move b5 because now white's knight on c4 is going to be kicked around a little bit. And that may reopen right. the opportunity for black to play bishop d6 and then maybe try to take on f4, break the center after his king maybe is on g8 and his rooks you know are, are fully shielding his king but definitely i think that this is the game that might have like the most amount of chaotic potential here uh in terms as of as far a... as like an opening knockout absolutely yeah i mean it was definitely intense you know if he castled queenside here which is one candidate move then i think the right move for white was bishop takes a7 um not winning the pawn on e5 since black's castled right but but leaving the black king on c8 kind of weak um, and if the knight on d7 moves, there's knight b6. So that would have been pretty intense. And if he played bishop c5 here, as I said, white castles queenside, bishop d4, rook takes d4. So both of those lines, I think, didn't quite work out for black. So then, personally, I would have probably played rook c8. Andrew chooses b5 over rook c8, I guess because he wants to leave his a pawn defended. He's a little worried about that. Um... Hang on, my computer wants to restart, and sometimes it insists on restarting no matter what I say. So let me just fight with that for a moment. <laughs> All right, sounds good. So <laughs> in, in, in this matchup, um, you know, we're already seeing that this has a potential to, you know, maybe be an upset if uh, Andrew can figure out how exactly he wants to continue, um, you know, from here in terms of building his advantage. I see the move bishop to e7, uh, which I was not expecting, but obviously the priority for black is to get this king safe. Uh, and by you know putting a piece in the e-file, you're not really closing the file, but you are closing off the file from your king. Uh, and that's why we're seeing the move f takes e5 here, f takes e5 in response. This bishop on d4 is being kicked, and now we see why Andrew played this move b5, because you've kicked this knight away from c4. If we go back a couple moves, and in this position, black played the move bishop to e7, what we'll see is takes, takes, and now this pawn on e5 is loose, and this king on e8 is uh, you know definitely exposed. So... We are seeing some merit here to Andrew's strategy, and that's going to make uh, you know Raja think here a little bit. This bishop will have to either drop back to e3 or on f2, and yeah, I... for those for those who are looking for blood, I think that um, Andrew's found a series of good moves that's going to mean this game won't be like lost in the first 20 moves. He's unless I'm missing something dramatic right now, he's going to survive this opening phase and get to play some kind of a middle game. Yeah, I'm actually kind of worried for White's position because it's more easy for me to see how like this knight on d7 and this bishop b7 are going to be active in the middle game whereas like this bishop on d4 and this knight on d2 you kind of wish that they switched places you know obviously barring hanging a piece i think he wants to play bishop f2 so he can castle kingside um because andrew's next move is going to be castles kingside so i think bishop f2 castles castles and then white's going to want to play knight to e4 to block that isolated pawn on a dark square um so we'll see Andrew will have one move there to try and, you know, set something up. I don't know if that'll be knight f6 or knight c5 or bishop c5, but I'll have one move there um, before white's able to play knight e4 and then start kicking him around with rook d1. Um, so it should be, should be somewhat close to balanced, I would say, at this point. I mean, one Maybe thing thinking about queen g2 is very risky, but I wouldn't do that. And I like pawns, but... Yeah, queen g2 definitely feels a little bit risky, but I think in that line that we just calculated after bishop f2, castles, castles, and where black gets this free move to stop white from playing knight to e4, I mean, one thing that I'm going to be, you know, worried about here if I'm white is what happens when this pawn goes to e4? What happens when this rook on a8 comes to e8 and this bishop moves out of the way to allow black to play this move e3? You know, really making this bishop on f2 you know, feel out of place, right? Have to go to g3, have to go to e1, somewhere, you know, definitely where it doesn't belong. Um, then at that point, black kind of has a free hand, and that's where these kind of positions get really dangerous in rapid games, where the evaluation might say equal, but it's white's responsibility to figure out where is that zero zero zero, uh, and that's what I'll be looking for. You know, should we go down this line? Oh, we've got a tactic over here from Deep Tie on Gush. After C five is played, um, which I think is going to turn out to be a blunder by Ladia, although I've only looked at it for a second. It forces the trade of the dark squared bishop, but I think Ladia just didn't even realize that Gush could play queen takes e5, and now he's sitting here thinking. And um, 
as far as I can tell, if pawn takes queen, knight f6 check, king moves, knight takes d7, and black's down a whole piece in the end game. So this is uh, this is over. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely a miss. Done. I'm looking at the amount of time that Ladia spent in the first half of the game. He's definitely spent half of his time just on this move alone. And I really like the tactic here. Just the understanding that, you know, the dark squares here were really important if Diane Ghosh decides he wants to go after queen b2. But c5 here, I mean... Never mind the tactics, just positionally it doesn't feel right. This pawn on d6 is going to be backwards. And so I wonder what Ladia's plan was here in terms of how to try to, you know, keep the game in the balance. I know Ladia that... Was thinking, Ladia was thinking that if he could get white to trade off the dark squared bishop, then he'd be great on dark squares and he wouldn't have to worry about stuff. Um, and additionally, that if the bishop just dropped back to c3, he would play the move b5. So he was thinking very concretely. He was thinking that he's coming very, very quickly with b5. And then he's threatening both b takes c4 and pawn to b4. So he's trying to force um, that dark squared bishop off the board. Unfortunately for him, it's just tactically losing, right? He's down a whole piece. And, and uh, I think we can already call this one yeah. and say that, uh, you know, Gush has done the job of a board one. He has decisively put down a fourth board and said, no, 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 no. I'm on form today. You're not messing with me. You know, don't get any ideas of winning the match from board four for your team. Right. And this is actually a really important game, I think, for Diptayan Ghosh. I mean, 24 hours ago, he wasn't even scheduled to play in this match. It was supposed to be their other board one, Bhaskar and Adiban. But, you know, we did see, and here we do have the final result, we did see Diptayan Ghosh play during the Summer Series Group C in the second week of that group. And, you know, he did get outplayed by Sevchenko twice. He did get outplayed uh, by Teresa Hakian and, you know, the knockout battle. And so it's good to see him here against, you know, an opponent that he really needed to beat for Mumbai. Uh, just find a quick tac tactic and uh, make Ladia feel uncomfortable early on. Yeah. Um, if you click over, other games are, are, are getting pretty intense as well. We've got the game between Sam Shanklin and the Prodigy, which is of, of interest. And uh, I actually want to take our focus to the Minnesota Reykjavik match. There's a position okay. heating up uh, with, I believe, Vladimir Georgiev is playing with the black pieces here. And this is going to be... You know, this is going to be pretty interesting, I think. I mean, obviously the queens are off of the board, but it's still a very, you know, tense fight. I mean, just a second ago, this king was being drawn out. Um, I mean, maybe we just missed the height of the action here, but, you know, to my eyes, it seems like white, you know, white was enjoying an advantage. And, and white here is Bragi Thorfinsson, um, mm -hmm. who did play in the first week of the Group B Pro Chess League Summer Series here. Um, yeah. But I don't know. What well, are your thoughts I mean here? Well, he's held on to an extra pawn at minimum, right? Like, right. he's up a pawn right now. It looks like Vladimir Georgiev's plan at some point may have been that Bishop B7 would force the Rook to retreat and that he would uh, win back this pawn on E4, at which point a black bishop on E4 would be amazing, right? Sort of freezing white's king side that wants to get out. Right. But with this move, knight A5, um, it doesn't look like that bishop's ever going to have a starring role in this game, right? I mean... You're not going to play bishop a8 to keep that bishop, are you, when you're not even threatening to take on c6 ever? Um, you know, and white's ready to play a move like knight d5 check, knight takes, pawn takes, and then that d5 pawn starts to become a dangerous passer. Yeah, I mean, this knight d5 point is an important, thing, uh, an important resource, I think, for white, because you mentioned here that you don't really want to play this move bishop to a8. For some of our players who are trying to find counter play for black, maybe they're thinking bishop to a8 followed by rook on h to c8 with the idea that the rook is now being attacked on c6. If the rook moves out of the way, maybe rook takes c3 becomes an issue uh, for white. But knight d5 is just in time there because that knight on f6 is so loose and you you know, you know, play hopscotch with the rook e4 c8, before. Rook h c8, which may seem desirable, actually has an overworking tactic against it, which is white just takes on c8 and black loses. Yeah, that's, that's just as bad. <laughs> If you take with the rook, then b7 hangs. If you take with the bishop, then knight c6 check. So, um, yeah. So he can't he can't do that. Okay. He plays bishop a8, praying that this bishop will, you know, be in the game at some point and be like an important factor. But, I mean, I strongly suspect that white is winning here. I'll just put it that way. I I mean, I'd be surprised if this isn't a winning position. Yeah. I mean, I think the only thing that uh, Bragi will have to solve here is he you know he needs to make sure that this e4 pawn is 
you know, covered. So in that way, should he ever move his rook away from c6, which I imagine he might want to play a move like rook to c7, you don't want to just give away this pawn on e4. So maybe move like bishop to d3, follow it up with like rook on h to f1, hit this knight on f6 multiple times, then threaten this idea of knight d5. It just seems to be coming together. And even though this seemed like a you know, an even stronger attack with queens on the board, this king is, you know, we've talked about king safety already today. This is another game where king safety is going to be a big issue uh, for black. Wait, it looks like Sam hung a rook somehow? What's happened here? Bishop takes e4 check. Oh my goodness, he didn't hang the rook. He got tacticked. Wow. Bishop I've... takes e4 check from the kiddo. And I was gonna say the strategic, um, the key strategic point in this position is that Sam has tried to kill that bishop on h7 with the d3 e4 pawn structure, which some would call bad, but normally is good. Um, in this particular position, because it keeps that bishop trapped, but rook c1 is a blunder. Kiddo jumps on it, wins an exchange and a pawn, and um, now a second rook. And uh, it looks like uh, it looks like I mean, Kiddo has won the game. It looks like Shankland is just purely running out of pieces. I mean, rook on d to f8 should be good enough here. Just get back the exchange. Oh and yeah, so much material. Uh, yeah, yeah, we talked about a rook and. Yeah, I mean, this oh, is just my bad. goodness. I mean, we talked that about... That was a uh, brutal finale. Clearly, bishop takes e4 check was missed, and then after it happened, you know, there was nothing really good to do but uh, to scramble around looking for something. For sure. And I, I, I guess the big question here for, you know, for our audience is, what made Shankland want to play this move king g2? Because this was effectively the setup. Uh, perhaps it might have been a mouse slip, and maybe he wanted to play bishop g2 there. Uh, but here we have a DTM Matal beating Sam Shankland uh, in... Yeah. Just a surprising first round. He played king g2, maybe to get off of queen d4 check because he felt that could come at any point. Um, but I mean, my guess is that Sam had a nice positional advantage before that blunder. Honestly, like my, I was, you know, I'd been glancing at all these positions earlier and was sort of vaguely thinking like, hey, this position uh, is probably good for for white, and you know, here's how I would explain it. You know, the bishop on h7 just doesn't really have a route back into the game. B6 is a little bit more of a target than A3 or D3. Um, and then, yeah, and then tactics, you know, they're part of the game too. Bishop E4 check, just devastating. And he can't even not take the bishop, right? Because he doesn't yeah. really have anywhere to go. It's it's just all bad. But I mean, I do have to give Aditya a lot of credit here. I'm looking through this line that he played in this opening. And, you know, when I was actually playing this exact setup for white, you know, one of the main deterrents for me to switch away and find a new opening was actually one of these lines where the bishop comes out early to f5 and puts a lot of pressure on white should he go for this hedgehog structure. And so when, you know, when white tries to play this move c4, this queen on c2 is immediately, you know, feeling a little bit uncomfortable. It forces you to make certain decisions. Should black ever play d take c4? And even though Shankland followed up with e4, which is, you know, in my opinion, the correct plan to play here, you're left with this pawn on d3, and that gave Aditya enough counterplay to, you know, stay in the game and then find a way to win the match. Yeah. And the game you were watching earlier with Vladimir Georgiev, um, I don't think I don't think that B-Man found the best um, continuation for White. I didn't find it either. I can't say exactly what he should have done, but I can tell that what he did did not put... Vladimir Georgiev away at all, right? It was the like, if nothing better line, right? Right. Like, he held his extra pawn. He kind of got developed, but he's left with a position where um, Georgiev has some counterplay and some compensation. So, very good chances of um, saving that draw still, I would say. Right. And this is, this is definitely going to be something that I want to follow with Bragi specifically. I remember his knockout battle game earlier this summer against a Wander where, you know, he was up upon the whole game. He took it to a winning Rook and Pawn end game and he just couldn't convert it and the game wound up being a draw and then he loses in the bullet tiebreak um in, in the time on off Sicilian if I recall correctly. And you know, he's going to have to, you know, push back the past and find a way here to convert his one pawn advantage. But already I you know, I'm not. I'm not saying I like black, but I I like black's chances to hold now that black's pieces make a lot more sense to me. This knight on a5 is kind of a no man's land, and you know this bishop on d3 is a passive piece. The rook on e1 is only you know existing right now just to protect this pawn on e4. So Bragi has a lot of work to do. He has to go back to the drawing board here. We've got some kind of decisive tactical phase happening also between um between Raja, Harshish, and um and uh, Roaring Seawolf, Andrew Hong where Andrew was leaving this pawn on e5 hanging, getting very aggressive with a4. Um, 
and uh, queen takes e5. He takes up the challenge, attacking the rook and bishop. Now, I thought the plan here might be rook to e4, but that's not what happened. I guess on rook e4, knight d4 would be a sufficient answer. So he goes rook to g4, now bishop g3. Oh la la, okay. He didn't have any kind of winning tactic, but I guess Andrew had a way to stay in the game for now, which is to go put a pawn on a2. And I guess material's still about equal. Yeah. After queen e7, b takes a2. Is he looking at something other than b takes a2? I mean, it has to be b takes a2, right? I mean, that's the only way that you're going to be able to create a resource to play for the win here. And there we go, b takes a2. And... Well, also, if you don't play b takes a2, you're playing for the loss. If white plays a takes b3, they're up two pawns. So right. was he double-checking rook d8? Is there... Is there something scary here with rook takes f6, maybe? Rook takes f6, queen takes f6, and the queen indirectly covers that check on d8. Doesn't look like... I mean, black's loose. That's why I've got this like instinct looking like, is there some way for black to just lose here? Black's pieces are loose, but I don't quite feel like rook f6, queen f6 is losing. Right, and I think one thing that I'm you know trying to figure out here for, for white is, you know, if this bishop were a light squared bishop, I think this is game over. But because it's a dark squared bishop, all of these exchange sacrifice kinds of lines, they just aren't working out. Any sort of rook takes f6, you really need a bishop on that long light squared diagonal to be able to right. play like a you know a bishop d5 or a bishop b3 kind of move uh, when that king it's comes like, out to f7. But That bishop's just kind of sitting there. It's not really like contributing anything significant. Right. And this knight on f6 is actually a really strong defensive piece. So for example, if... Uh, Black plays this move king to f7. This move rook e1 is not really viable because there's no mate threat on queen to e8 because you have two pieces covering it. With the knight mm -hmm. on f6, it frees up your queen to you know either play move like queen d7 and just force the pieces off the board and then try to win the end game with this a pawn, or you know it frees you up to try to continue attacking on the king side, maybe like an h5 h4 type of attack. Um, right, or rook e4 sort of covering lots of central space and trying to come to e2. You know, it's true that basically this bishop on g3 is not it's not giving enough oomph to really make it feel like white's got a winning attack coming and if it tried to come to e5 or something then there's mate on g2 unfortunately so like bishop e5 would be well intentioned but not good enough so rook to a1 so basically he's trying to control that a pawn to me that says that um white doesn't have a winning attack right if they're going off to try and control that a pawn and i think black's position is strong enough to play moves like rook a4 queen c4 and hold the pawn um, and with a rook on a1, he's not going to get mated. So my guess is that somehow these complications turned out good for black. Right. And when you see moves like rook a1 here, they're purely defensive. And all you're doing is you're just trying to stop black's you know big plan here. I mean, to me, that almost kind of feels like a resignation without actually tipping over the king, right? Basically, white saying is like, I have nothing. What do you have? I'll play defense now. And, you know, mm -hmm. we don't see it as much during these PCL games because they're rapid and things happen quickly. But like in an over the board game or in a long time control game, these moments are really important because that's where like that momentum shifts, right? The initiative shifts now to black. And so I have an idea here for black. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking maybe pawn to b4 might be an idea i guess this will cover it so that's a that's that's a good thing for this move but what about queen e4 now that the bishop's dangling on e5 right previously i was thinking that queen e4 wasn't a winning move because of queen d1 from white but if black plays queen e4 now then queen d1 queen e5 is not viable so what would white play on queen e4 would they play like bishop f6 um and then queen b1 check king f2 Something like that? I mean, if, if you're counting on this, if you're white, I think that, you know, that's already not a good sign. So, for example, the line that you pointed out here, bishop takes f6, queen b1 check. You know, if you take, you mean black simply just queens here. And I think with, you know, with the tempo that he gets from the check and also being able to take on b2, he should be able to find a way to win this bishop on f6. So I think that's bad news for white if he's counting on this line. Mm-hmm. I'm just looking around for a second um yeah georgiev has totally escaped if you click over to that for a second and you see this counter plan pressure he had with the passive bishop on d3 just defending e4 like all the white pieces are just kind of like targets and so white just really got under pressure after rookie three 
there was this knight takes e4 tactic. Knight e4, knight e4, and you can't take with the bishop because of rook d1. So that's why the whole idea of just sitting there with bishop d3, it's just like that's never how you win really, right? right. Instead of rook to e3, he could have maybe tried knight c4 in that position, leaving the pawn on d3 hanging but trying to win back a pawn on e5. Um, but but again there, you know, black could trade on d3, you take on e5 and play rook d2, and black would get enough counterplay as well probably. But as it is, he sort of loses back his pawn, and now black has this beautiful pawn center in it. This is a kind of equal material endgame that I've won many times from the black side in Sicilians. So um, hopefully that's a lesson to everyone that like the good enough, just hold in there, don't find the best continuation. Uh, can sometimes you know lead you down a path to eventually losing even right because right. I think that's what he's risking now is he's risking losing this and he needed to find some more aggressive continuation you know with bishop c4 knight to d5 rook c7 something like that you know not just not just develop slowly and try and defend a weak pawn right and these are those scary moments of, like these rapid games you don't have the same conditions as you would in like an over the board game and you know i i've had you know i've been coached by several gms and you know one of the things that they always try to say is oh when you have the advantage don't try to complicate things keep things easy but you know for mm -hmm. you know someone who's not like a fabiana caruana type or a wesley so type where that that's just automatic to them like you it's very easy to zone out your opponent's counterplay in those cases and just say, oh, it's fine, I'm still winning. You know, this line is going to be better. And what you do in those kind of situations is you accidentally give yourself concessions. Uh, in this case, I mean, black could easily win this game now. I mean, this is it's not clear to me that white is actually going to go for it and win this. Yeah, Hannes Stefansson, a.k.a. the robot, has come out ahead by two pawns um, in a very complicated game, but um, looking like he's doing pretty well. Well, he's just tried to pick a third pawn. That's very, that's very brave, sending his king out. One game that might actually be interesting is the game of Rene uh, Terry Luan, who has yeah. 10 seconds left on his clock. But oh my God. from a positional evaluation, his position might not actually be that bad. It's just the question is, can he survive off an increment here? And I don't think he will. Not, but it's so complicated. I guess he's going for knight f4, give up the d pawn, take on e6 at some point. That knight on e4 is really good. He had to play c4, c5 because he was under so much pressure against the f2 square at one point a couple moves ago. Um, so, oh, and Roaring Seawolf has won. Let's take a check look. out how his queen got to b1 real quick. Let's take a look at the end of that game. Falling. Bishop e5, queen e4 did happen. So I think bishop e5 was probably sort of like a tactically losing move. But we'll see. Bishop takes f6, queen b1, and he has to come up with the king. And the point is, queen takes a1. Queen e7 check and, you know, at least a perpetual, if not like a surprising checkmate, you know, down a rook and the a pawn about the queen. But in this position, he could play queen b2 check and he simply took on f6 with the pawn. Queen d7, king g6. You s it's very nice how his rook and queen cover like every square. A king on g6 that almost can't be checked is kind of crazy, right? Right, and that's actually exactly how this game eight? ended. Is there not queen e8? Um, there's no way to just defend with queen d1 because black can always trade the queen and then promote. So white is forced to go for perpetual, and he just didn't even see the rook could cover g4. If right. he played queen e8, was he also going to lose? That's kind of the question, right? Queen e8. And as we get um, in these results, we actually just got in three more. Daniel Naraditsky has beaten Rakesh Kulkarni. So okay. the, the San Francisco mechanics do get their second point of the round. And in the Minnesota right. versus... Reykjavik match, uh, Hans Stefansson did win that queen and rook endgame, while Vladimir Georgiev actually did come out uh, and win with the black pieces there, um, you know, in that endgame that we were just looking at. Right. I mean, just classic seeing that sort of duo advancing down the center for black and the white king on c1 so far away. A lot of these Sicilian endgames are actually won because black's got a majority of pawns on the king side. When you get to the endgame, white's king is over on b1 or something, and black starts advancing, advancing some pawns on the uh, king side and just sort of like easily wins a game with equal material it happens a lot so right and so that leaves us with only a couple of games let's uh, go back to that renito terry luan game because yeah, that is that, definitely that heating game. up and both players are now under a eight, minute e5 so he's going to be able to take on e6 black wants to play queen g3 he can always block that diagonal with f4 is going to be a great move actually he could play queen takes d5 here so queen g3 queen h2 isn't made him one so black needs to stop queen takes d5 somehow and rook takes d4 probably is not how allowing some double checks and probably a quick checkmate 
Yeah, that just feels like game over, and that's why we're seeing this move. Rook CD8. Knight E7, that'll win it. Oh, man, the guy with 10 seconds is pulling it off. Well, I mean, we've seen him play so well before. I mean, Rene <laughs> Terry Lujan, he didn't do as well during the Summer Series Group D when he did debut, but he has won title Tuesdays in the past, and there he goes. He gets a point here for the Minnesota Blizzard, which means that we only have one game left uh, now he's in this down round. To Flores. Mauricio Flores, he's their board one for the Blizzard today, but he actually has got a tough position perhaps here right or at least a complicated position at least black's king is terribly placed so right. black probably can't win with the king on a6 if the black king were anywhere where it could move like b3 d2 g3 then black would probably be winning right and it's actually that's an instructive point that you bring up here as like the players are trying to figure out how to carry out this end game we've talked a lot this round about king safety and how it's important to keep your king safe and to some of our lower rated players they might see this king on a6 is like well that king is perfectly safe here what do you mean it's terrible as few maybe pieces... last move rook to f1 instead of rook f2 what would have happened there rook, rook f1. f1 then if knight e2 he's got rook e1 winning i'm pretty sure and otherwise he just queens yeah but so rook f2 was weird. Now bishop b3, leaving e2 just hanging. And yeah, you see his king position kind of lost him this game. I think uh, I think white's going to go ahead and win it using the maneuver of knight f4 g6. Instead of trying to play h7 and then win the end game with the extra knight with the black king threatening to remove all his pawns on the king side, instead he goes for knight g6 and uh, that's it, right? Right. New queen. Mauricio taking care of it and uh, giving the Blizzard a quick 3-1 lead. Now, I will say that in this match, board one versus board four just doesn't mean that much in this entire match. Right. Um, since both teams have these super balanced lineup with players between 2,400 and like 2,550, um, there's nobody who outrates their opponent by more than 100 points. That means any round anyone could win. It doesn't really matter if you're the board one or the board four. You know, anyone could be the the person who who gets the match one for their team. So um, you won't know. International master David Thorfinson, I think. Uh, Chardison. Char David Chardison. He had a chance there, I think. I don't know. Instead of rook f2 to maybe play rook f1. And I think... Uh, I think basically white would have had to just sack the knight, play knight takes e2, rook e1, h5. Where was that? Uh, move 53 after king g5. A little tactic with rook f1. I think it was the only option there at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just so our viewers can see it, you have knight takes e2, bishop takes e2. Yeah. No, knight takes e2, rook e1. Ah, rook e1, right, right, right. And now we've That's got the, the pin. Point. And I, the, I think this is the best that, that white could do, though, because e1 queen was threatened, right? So then h5, rook takes e2, rook takes e2, bishop takes e2, h6, bishop d3. It looks like black has enough to win that position. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, all of this is obviously pretty difficult to see when you've got 11 seconds left on your clock. Um, yeah. But that could have made the difference there. We could have had a tied match there. Instead, it's a 3-1 lead for the Minnesota Blizzards, a 3-2 lead for the San Francisco Mechanics, although I bet the Mechanics are unhappy about how they got there. Um, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with the second round. Well, I think the two players who lost will be unhappy about the, how they got there, and the two who won will be, like, cool with it. <laughs> right. So we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in about two minutes uh, with right. this cover, extended coverage of the second round of the Pro Chess League Summer Series play-in round. See you guys in a minute.
don't know if I actually got this. Oh, wait. Oh, do I win the queen? I win the queen? Yeah! Yeah! I won! I won a game! I won a game! Yeah! I won a game! <laughs> yes. Now he jumped off my lap. I did not drop a cat. Yes. <laughs> ah. And that clip that you just saw there was Goldust Tori in the Group A Live Club match. She was playing for Chengdu, scored a point there against the St. Louis Archbishops. Those two teams will actually be playing each other again in the Pro Trust League Summer Series quarterfinal on August 30th. Oh, yeah. The first ever matchup between two, you know, semifinal, those two semifinal teams. They narrowly missed each other in both, you know, of the two previous semifinals. Uh, Chengdu obviously yeah. joined the league in 2018, so they weren't in the 2017 season. But this will be the first time they ever play head-to-head. -head. That'll be an exciting one. Mark your calendars for August 30th. Uh, that's when that match will take place. And, um, you know, we've got, you know, a lot of different teams playing in the Summer Series. And we know that fans all over the world are watching this morning. They're excited to see their teams play. Um, but obviously, some teams didn't have to play through this round to get here. Uh, and that takes us to our daily question today, which is, which team uh, that won their group are you most excited to watch during the the Pro Chess League Summer Series. David, of the four group winners that we have here, which one are you most excited to see? For me, it's uh, the the new team, the Capybaras, because I've never seen them play, and like I'm always excited to see new stuff. So um, that's me. I mean, I'm obviously excited to see like you know teams that I know are good play. It's always fun, but some somehow like the new kids like really exciting, right? When you've got like a super tournament. Eight twenty-seven hundreds you're used to, and then like right. one new like sixteen-year-old who just made twenty-seven hundred. Oh wait, don't the copy bars have a player like that? Yeah, Ali Reza Faruja will you know be on the uh, Sao Paulo copy bars roster along with uh, GM Krikor, who is obviously a well-known streamer here on Chess.com, and Sandro Moreca, who played in two weeks for the Sao Paulo copy bars during the group stage. So. You know, that's going to be you know a team dynamic that I'm going to be interesting to watch. I think we have three proven players on their team, but the big question mark for them is how do they play in their first ever 4v4 matchup, and who is their board for, and how good are they, right? I mean, that board right. four will make all of the difference. You and I both know this because we've both managed teams that have had this situation or have played against teams that have had that kind of lineup. Um, the team that I'm most excited to watch on August 30th is actually the Montreal Chess Bras. We've, you the know, Chess Bras? Yeah, I mean, they're like, they seem to be like the most obvious choice because you know they've been in the Pro Chess League every year, but they have not been in a playoff game since the 2017 semifinals when they lost to the St. Louis Archbishops okay. in overtime. So this is their right. opportunity to go into the 2020 Pro Chess League season, you know, talk about you know, all of the things that have been said about them being relegated in 2018, missing the cut after dominating the whole season in 2019. This is their chance to come back in and you know, really make a statement, um, you know, in, in a playoff format. So I'm going to be keeping an eye on the Montreal Chess Bros because they're on the tough side of the bracket. It's true. And they seem to have like one of the best, if not the number one, like fan followings of any team right now. So you're definitely not alone in being most excited to see them play. They might be... They might be the most popular answer to our daily question, in fact. Right, and I wouldn't be surprised about that. I mean, the other two teams that we see here, obviously there are two finalists from the Pro Chess League semifinals. Uh, but if we take a look at that bracket again, uh, you know, we mentioned this earlier, St. Louis, Chengdu, Montreal, all on the same side. And, you know, we've got, you know, the bottom, bottom snowballs, you know, they might have a free run at the finals here uh, if they can perform at the level that we expect them to, right? I mean, yeah. we think that they have to be favorites against Moscow. We don't really know enough about Sao Paulo to know if they'll make it to that final. Uh, and then obviously San Francisco yeah. or Mumbai, they're both already proving today that they're very competitive teams. Um, I mean, nothing, nothing's ever free in the Pro Chess League. Like, I think there are two clear favorites in the matches today, for example. But if either match were an upset, I wouldn't be, like, at all surprised. I wouldn't be like, you know, eyes bugging out if, um, if, you know, the Puffins or the Movers won today, I wouldn't be at all surprised. So I think there are favorites and bot and bot and definitely, you know, such a proven squad made it to the finals this year. They've got to be like a significant favorite. And yet it's not, it's not free for them. I imagine they'll be tested every round. Right. I mean, if I had to put odds to this, I think like the bottom, bottom snowballs have a 50% chance of, you know, getting to the finals of that group. But I mean, that Moscow Wizards game, it's a trap game. The Wizards were in the Eastern Division playoffs. They were the third seed, uh, I believe. No, they were, they were the fourth seed, I believe. And they lost to the Tbilisi Gentlemen 9-7. to seven. Um, So that could be a trap game for them as well. And that's one of the beauties of the way that this bracket was structured is, you know, because the teams had to earn their seeds as opposed to get there purely based on, you know, 
team performance, you know, including fan performance, you know, was a big component in that. Um, you know, there's a really good chance we're going to see a Cinderella story come August 31st, August 31st yeah. for the uh, Summer Series Championship Final. I mean, according to my my following and research on the league, if the Wizards could get Gregorians to play for them in one of their um in in their playoff match, they could be the favorites in that in that first round quarterfinal um against Bottom Bottom. Right. They could, I mean, like legitimately, if 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 he and Dobrov play and Dobrov, you know, he's the manager, I'm sure he'll be available. If those guys play, I would put the Wizards as actually being favorites against Bottom Bottom once I saw that lineup. But they didn't use him in the playoffs of the regular, you know, spring season of the 2019 Pro Chess League. So I'm going to go with the team which has always put out the winning lineup and, you know, go for Baden Baden. Right. I mean, that match, I think, is going to come down to about, you know, come down to individual performances, right? We saw Savchenko when he played really well, and we also saw Savchenko when he struggled. And so, you know, in this in this matchup, if Boris Savchenko is playing, if he can, you know, if he can turn it on and play his best chess, Baden Baden should be a little bit worried. I like that you brought up Gregorians there. He actually advanced to the Speed Chess Championship through the qualifiers a couple years ago. Uh, he's another really strong, talented blitz player um, that a lot of pro chess league players just don't know about yet. So, you know, things are going to be stacking up fairly interesting there in the bracket but before we get to that we do have a play-in round to cover and yeah. i believe the second round and, games are underway and isaac we got to go for a second to hunin against mauricio flores i'm already there <laughs> you're already there okay because i mean i know our plan was to go watch a dtm Ital after his huge upset against shanklin see if he could score again against naroditsky um but like look at this opening that white played he played h4 like you know online bullet style right h4 what and then not only that i mean h4 says like what he's playing to play h5 and sack that pawn like it's a bullet game but then after cd4 e4 h6 he just leaves the bishop hanging on f6 too i mean on, on g5 too yeah i mean this is definitely you know mauricio is going to have to spend some time here to make sure he has the most accurate defense um, but I guess we're going to have to test to see if it works, right? So obviously our critical... Or he might have to just lose, right? It'd be like, what do you expect me to do? I expect <laughs> you to die. <laughs> I mean, that that's certainly a potential outcome here. But okay, let's take a look at some lines, right? So if black plays h takes g5, this is obviously the line that uh, white had to have calculated here in order to get this far. I don't calculated anything. He spent six seconds. It's just like, he's just like, I'm playing a bullet game. It'll work out. I mean, to be fair, that was the most amount of time he spent on any move so far. So relative, right. like he Wait was thinking about this move. Four seconds to throw the H on the first time. <laughs> Six seconds with a piece hanging. Yeah. Um, okay. So H takes G five, right? We have to come up with a yeah. line for this. You know, if, if, sure. if we're white, right, to justify this, you know, the sacrifice. So uh, H takes G six is the only move. H takes G six. Because on H six, Bishop. Wait, on H six, Bishop H H eight. He could play Bishop takes G six actually. So there could be a second line possible with h6 because actually there are some scenarios where like your own bishop on h8 is taking away an important flight square i was thinking like obviously you have to play hg and open your rook but i guess nothing is obvious here right so if we take a look at this move h6 i mean black probably just needs to give up the bishop right but if you give up the bishop you open up this h file white castle's queen side this knight's coming into g5 and if you give up the bishop you're just worse like for yeah. nothing for no hope right like white can still play bishop takes g6 at any point later in the game and they've got the h file so you have to play bishop h8 to keep your extra um bishop and then white plays bishop takes g6 and then what comes for black queen to e8 maybe i mean that's i mean even here, I'd be thinking about h7 just to draw that king out on g7 and just make it a target, right? I mean, at that point, you're blocking on the h8 bishop. You're effectively up a piece. Um, mm -hmm. So you have compensation at that point. You can't play knight takes h7 there because bishop takes h7. I mean, this... Oh, man, Mauricio's going to be in the tank here, man, because this is actually not that easy for black. I mean, he thought that his h6 was, like, a brilliant move. Let's just, like, give the reasoning on it, okay? He thought mm -hmm. h6 was a brilliant move because whether white retreats the bishop or takes on f6... He'll always be able to answer h5 with g5 once he's got that h6 move in, right? Right. So he's he's just his plan is to never let that rook on h1 get into the game, keep things from getting complicated. He wants to avoid a certain style of game. Once you see your opponent play h4, you're like, oh, that kind of a player. I just need to avoid one scenario against this kind of player, and I'll eventually win the game, right? Just avoid an open h file mating attack. But the right. guy plays h5, and it's like, well, now the only scenario available is an open h-file mating attack. 
Right, and Mauricio's made his move here. He's played Knight takes H5, which takes H5. was the one, one move we didn't look at so far. But already, yeah. I'm I'm seeing a lot of options that White can start to think about here and really enjoy. I mean, let's take a look at just Canada moves, right? There's like Bishop G6, Bishop H6, Rook takes H5, G4. There's a mm. bunch of different moves that White can t think about here right. and really frustrate. G4 um, feels like the kind of move he would go for. Yeah, I mean. It seems like he's like a step above the bullet version of h4, h5, right? The bullet version is whatever. You just throw the rook on h5, you know, g takes h5, retreat your bishop or something. But this guy, ooh, I don't know if the if this followed by g4 works. I was wondering about this. This was one thing that I was thinking about, but I liked the idea of being able to keep that bishop on g5 and force black to have to waste that tempo. Play. Just spend a tempo g5. playing hg5, right? I think g4 was quite good. But maybe here the idea is what to play... What was black going to play against g4? So here, if, G4. if black plays h takes g5, then after g takes h5, there's no way to stop white from playing h takes g6 because the pawn can't move. And it seems like white gets exactly the scenario he wants. Yeah, he actually, that seems pretty bad. Now g4. So now, I mean, presumably his only plan is to play g4 here, or is it to play bishop g6 explosively? I mean, he's definitely thinking about bishop g6 right now. That's why he hasn't moved yet. Because now if, if you play thinking, g4, thinking about, you're right. there's knight f4, right? And knight f4 covers the g6 pawn. So g4 is a very committal move here, even though it looks like it's a really uh, simple move. I like this idea that you're bringing up now. Bishop g6, f g6, queen takes g6. You're getting at least one of these two pieces back. This king is wide open. Well, All when of you these play bishop takes g6, when you play bishop takes g6, black could trade the bishop off on d2. If they want to try and run away with all the stuff, then king takes d2 yeah. to develop the rook. F takes g6, queen takes g6, knight g7. And then... Is there any sort of, like, rook h8, knight g5? No, because f2 is hanging. So you can't try this clearance sacrifice idea threatening mate because there's this idea of rook f2, I think. But even there, it's not so clear, right? Because now rook takes f2, king to e1. Where are your checks? Oh, you have queen right. g8. You have queen g8. But it still continues. The line still continues. Queen g8... King takes f2, and then this rook is threatening rook h1 mate. Well, well, wait, why, you don't even have to sack the rook on h8 to go for this. Um, just play knight g5 first after knight g7. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? that's true, and too. And you're threatening checkmate just the same with either queen h7 or rook h8 setting it up. Right? Yeah. And then if rook f2, you're going to attack the rook with your king. Yeah. Holy <laughs> smoky. I mean, this is... This is rough, and bishop g6 is on the board now after about a 90-second think here from white. Oh my goodness. I, I don't this think you could take this pot or this bishop. I can't even look at the other games, Isaac. Yeah, I mean, this is this has definitely so far been like our most exciting game of the day. And, you know, I... Yeah, so here we go. Bishop d2 first. Um, right. So king takes d2. This is the line that we looked at. Man, every game pales in comparison to this thing. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm glancing around now just to be fair, because, you know, someone else might be sacking stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, Vladko may have just sacked something by accident against the robot. <laughs> uh, that's not. Oh, yeah, that's not good. Queen trade into knight d two, and the robot is just like mowing them down machine like today. I mean, I I imagine this is uh going to be a game that he wins. Right. Uh, so that could be a quick two zero for Stefanson. Um, yeah, but but nothing else that can commands my attention like bishop takes g6 yeah bishop takes g6 okay so here we go knight f4 this was flores's planned response so in a perfect world you find a way to move this bishop just make it disappear off the board and play queen g queen h7 right this would be the one time if you could take p your own pieces off of the board you would want to do that uh unfortunately you can't play bishop takes f7 because rook takes f7 will cover that h7 square and you just aren't going to be able to make progress there so Hate to help your opponent out like that right yeah. How about bishop e4 as a way to try and get rid of that bishop? Um, it has the advantage of sort of having a concrete threat, right? To go take on b7. Mm -hmm. And if black trades on e4, then queen e4 threatens the knight, the rook, and checkmate. That looks effective. Uh, that yeah. triple threat. And I mean, it gets uh -huh. worse, too, because if you're trying to calculate this with black, and you're thinking, well, I could just play d5, and now there's no bishop b7. Well, white will just play bishop takes d5, and it's like, guess what? Exactly. Same problem. So, oh, wait, is this I Wait, what's this idea? How is he going to get his queen to h7? So king no g7. No clue. Is he going to try, like, bishop g8 or some sort of funny business? Okay, queen f5. This is much more normal. Yeah, this feels like it's already... 
But that was a good question, Isaac. Is he thinking Bishop G8? Just I gotta get that bishop out of the way. But I gotta say, Bishop E4 had to just be like over, like just right. resigns. I'm I'm shocked that 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 didn't happen. Right. I'm truly shocked that we didn't get that. Is Bishop G8 possible now though? But the problem is, rook, well, Rook takes G8, Rook H7, King F8, Queen takes F7 is mate. So just right. to show everyone on the on the line, the idea behind Bishop H7, Bishop G8 is to play this move, Rook to H7 in the future. And if the Black were to take, is, you've got the mate. weird thing is, Bishop G8 may not threaten much of anything right now because Bishop G8, if you play Queen H7, King F6, the King sort of seems to get away. Yeah. And if you play Rook H7, then the King can take on G8 because you don't have Queen F7 anymore. Although maybe then you double rooks and you do sort of like win a move or two later. Well, actually, no. If In this case, rook h7, king takes g8. Don't you have rook h8, king takes h8, and then rook h1 with idiot queen h7? Oh! <laughs> king to g7 again, though. And on queen h7, king f6. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. But I but I think bishop g8 may, may be a good move here. It may be good enough. Oh, he plays it. He plays it. <laughs> yeah. So we have bishop to g8 on the board, and... The other nice thing is it prevents queen f6, which would be the big, like, move that would end white's attack, kind of. Like, right. a huge defensive resource coming to the king. Here, if queen f6, he has queen h7 made in one. So um, he's at least keeping black's defensive resources at bay, I think. And it looks like the black king is just alone. Like, he's just going to get taken out. Yeah, and I mean, this is all really impressive, and I have to wonder, I mean, this is just a Tory, but maybe this was all prep from from White here. Just, you know, this okay. is all well-known theory. I mean, White is just setting up, and then H4, and then H5. I mean, this has to so, have been in his, like, pocket. So Knight D7, Rook H7, King G8, Rook A to H1, Knight to F6, bringing a defender. If Queen G5... You know, quote unquote checkmate. There's knight to g6 blocking it, so it's not checkmate. Um, if rook h8 check, king g7, rook one to h7. There's knight takes h7, and white doesn't have checkmate. Yeah, close call on that. Um, yeah, there's just how do you bring in more pieces? Um, rook to h4. <laughs> but even there, you're not even threatening rook g4 at that point because the knight's coming that square. Because there's knight takes g6. Maybe bishop takes f7. Right? We exploded on g8. Explode on f7. It almost feels like atomic chest. The way this bishop's just in there. Yeah, I mean this is this is yeah, next level chaos. There. Knight d7 allows bishop takes f7. One person in chat is uh coming up with the same bishop takes f7 idea as me. Um, that yeah. takes away the g8 square from the black king, so it threatens rook h7 mate. Um, if queen g5 here, black can take it with the queen. In other cases, when you play queen g5, there might be knight g6. So I'm not sure exactly when someone thinks there's a mate there. But um, yeah, this is uh... maybe we missed a mate somewhere in that line. Well, here after knight d7, I, I do like this idea of bishop f7, right? Because after rook f7, then just rook h7, it's game over. Like, So bishop takes f7. They can't allow mate in one, so pretty much you would expect knight f6 from black. They're one defensive piece coming to cover that square. Right. Um, yeah, you can't really deflect. If you play knight g5, you just rook f7. Where does the king wind up walking in that line? Knight G so bishop f7, knight f6, knight g5. Nice idea. And the idea is if rook f7, rook h7, check, right? So yeah. if if I play knight g5, you take, I play rook h7. And the idea is that this yeah. knight is actually pinned because of the mating idea here. So how do you continue if you're if you're black here? I assume you want to look at king to f8, right? I mean, this Ooh, is the move you I want to look that, at first. I think that, I think that st salt and ill were right that there was a checkmate in our long line earlier. So rook h7, king g8, so, rook eight eight one, so knight f6. Wait, so rook h7, king g8, rook eight eight yeah. h1, knight to f6. Queen g5. Queen g5, knight g6. Knight blocks on g6, right? And then queen h6, just trying to Ooh. checkmate on g7, and if knight h7, queen h7 mate. 
And then if knight e8 here, just rook h8, yeah. Just rook h8, knight h8, queen h8. So there is a clear checkmate here with rook h7. Just, I mean, basically almost all with checks, just no no real branches for black. Just just finishing him. Move bishop f7 also looks pretty promising. I think uh, they all look good, right? It's just a dart. You just have to throw, <laughs> throw a move on the board. Don't lose on time. And this one should be 1-0 yeah. in five moves, right? By the same token, the move knight g5 is probably winning here. Um, so good lord. Yeah. Good lord. I'm I'm glad that he's spending some time. He better he better find a checkmate, man. Yeah, I mean you would think so. It's you know, I don't know if uh you know, I don't know when Mauricio Flores got up this morning. It's eleven AM in Minnesota, but if he hasn't had breakfast, this is certainly <laughs> this is certainly his right. portion right here. I mean this is uh this is not good for, for black at all. Um, right. There's I, also a crazy move possible here, which I hadn't mentioned yet, which is rook h eight, just right away here. Uh, just posting up in there, just on the theme of throwing every piece there, you know. Because if king h8, queen h7 is mate, if rook g8, you come back to h7 with the rook and mate on f7. So you could play rook h8 and rook h1. You could do a lot of fun stuff, but... Um, rook h8 is definitely the prettiest move that's possible. But you better win, because you know, <laughs> rook h7 is like a mate in six. So yeah. if, you don't, if you don't win, you're going to be regretting this one. Um, let me see if there's anything else particularly exciting going on i think a really cool tactic from um raja 3401 has just been played um this is a line of the scotch which is very hard for white to handle without mishap and it looks like uh, a mishap has just happened yeah that's definitely how you say it um so um basically it looks like the c4 pawn you know is impenetrable with the pawn on b3 in this line from white which is sort of all designed but, um, you know, with the queen on a5, there's this indirect attack on the rook on a1 at first. So the rook moves off of a1 to avoid a takes b3, a takes b3, queen a1. Um, but once rook b1 happens, now that's lined up with the rook on b8. So now black goes for a b3, a b3, and then taking on c4. <sighs> White may not have anticipated that this was even legal, basically, right? But for argument's sake, let's check if this works. Yeah. Okay. Because it's pretty complicated. So let's say we play pawn takes c4. I'm pretty sure black's idea is rook takes b1 there. Right. Uh, and if queen takes yeah. b1, just queen takes c3. Rook b1, queen b1, queen c3. But we have to, you know, blunder check this. Bishop d2 from white. Now what does black do? Because at the end of this, white might have queen b8 winning a rook. And black's whole tactic has netted them a pawn, right? So uh, That's a good point because queen d4 looks really appealing. But then queen b8... King e7. Yeah, if, if you win a pawn and the and the and the uh, counter attack is to win a rook, it's, it's not a good, it's not a good move. Um, but queen d4, maybe he can sack the rook and go for a win there, right? So queen right. b4, let's say. Queen b8. Queen b8. King, king e7. e7. We've all seen like a queen take a rook, right? And then the king just get wrecked in the middle. Queen takes d3, and then black wants to play bishop takes c4. I mean, odds are this is brilliant, right? Wait, can uh can White still survive here with uh, Queen G seven, Bishop C four, Queen F six, and try to make some sort of perpetual work? All right, sorry, say that again. Um, so Queen G seven after uh, Queen takes D yeah. three, and then right. if Bishop takes C four, then Queen F six. Queen F six. Although and I guess A3. after King E eight, Queen H eight, Bishop F eight, right? Right. Basically, you're trying to save it with a perpetual. If Bishop to F eight, then maybe you can try and like keep running with king d1 and maybe black can't quite win maybe they have to take a perpetual but it feels like white will lose honestly it feels like black should at least you know even if they just take the pawn on g2 black should be better there right they've got right. a couple pawns a bishop pair and a white king in just dire straits so right and hans stefansson um, and the other match between minnesota and reykjavik uh, hans stefansson for reykjavik has just beaten um uh, nicola uh yeah the robot strikes yeah we have taken your pieces next okay um all right i'm being told that sam shanklin might be losing again yeah that was be... one thing i was looking at and you know we talked about before how rakesh is just a uh, world beater in sub saturday uh yeah. he is down the exchange yeah he is losing so I mean, I wouldn't say it's necessarily easy to convert. I wouldn't put money on myself against a twenty seven hundred with white here. Right. Um, I could definitely see myself not uh, not converting. But um, you know, if you gave Carlson white 
I would uh, assume that Carlson was going to win the game. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of agree with that assessment because this bishop on d6 is actually a really important defender. It's covering the b8 square. It's stopping this d5 pawn from moving up the board. Uh, Does bishop c5 maybe save the game already here just directly? That I mean, I think black's only one pawn away from holding. Like, if yeah. you take the f2 pawn off the board, I don't see black losing. So what I'm calculating is bishop c5, rook f1, rook to d2, and then if rook bd1, bishop takes f2 check. And yeah, the rooks just can't cover f2 and d5 simultaneously, can they? Right, and if you play like king h1 here, for example, this is still equal, I believe, after rook d1, uh, rook d1. Playing that part confidently, like once the f2 pawns off the board, a rook gets traded, the bishop comes back to d6. Black has a flawless structure. You can't even attack anything. I, I mean, I just struggle to see white winning that end game there. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe white could play a move like, I don't know, you know, like maybe something where he just lets the d5 pawn go and keeps the more compact three pawns. And if Sam plays rook takes d5, plays rook b5. So maybe like king g2. Rook d5, rook b5, and then, you know, hope that the rook is kind of like tied up and Sam has to mess up the structure he's playing with. Yeah, so he's yeah. going for that. So rook b5. So his plan is rook d5, king g2. And then he'll want to later play rook to c1. Maybe there the key move for Sam would be rook to f5. Yeah, and, he could and still then defend hold the rook with the g pawn. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it looks like Rakesh is going for that win. He can, like, feel and taste it, huh? He's like, he knows what it's like to knock out a 2700. Yeah, I mean, he's done it before on chess.com. He'll do it again. And I think one other player who's going to have to prove his rating is actually Daniel Naroditsky here in this game uh, against Aditya Matal, who beat Sam Shankland earlier today. Um, right. You know, we have, you know, we have Danya being up a pawn. He has the up pair of bishops, pawn. but they're doubled pawns. And so he's going to have to be precise if he wants to convert this. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, the the A pawns, they're not irrelevant to winning the game because there are scenarios where, like, you know, you use your extra pawn to deflect on the king side and then you have to swing over to the queen side to finish things. But to some extent, we could say he's got a healthy extra pawn on the king side where he could make a majority. He's got a pretty well-placed bishop on an open board. So I don't think that the doubled A pawns are particularly hampering his winning chances right now. Mm -hmm. um, I would still estimate his winning chances quite highly here myself at the moment right he wants to get his rook to the second rank you know so he mital needs to get his king out of back rank mate so that his rook can cover the second rank like really soon because danya wants to go rook d4 rook d2 that's why he kicked that knight and moved his bishop off of e4 right and that's why we're seeing the move king right. g1 here although i'm not convinced that this is the fastest way to maybe solve this this problem? Maybe h4. Well, h4 was not le not good, but h3 and then rook e2 would have been faster. He wants to answer rook d4 with rook e2. That's kind of like what he needs to do. Um, but there may also be a threat of rook d7 here. Right. Like rook e2, rook d7. If the knight goes to e6, then rook e7 is probably winning. So. You get into like some scenario can you play like rook e2 rook d7 rook c2 then bishop e4 you're overloaded you lose um yeah uh, this is this is tough stuff for like a for like a kid to to find the defenses um when you're under this kind of pressure right i mean the good news for him is he does have a time advantage here he does have about an extra three minutes to figure things out got the time to figure it out that means he was like strong enough to play a, a very decent uh, middle game without sort of just like running off you know, running out of time resources to figure out whatever pressure Naroditsky was putting on him. We had a piece sack from Harshish Raja, so that position's like super exciting as well. Right. Um, this was the game that we were we were looking at earlier that was just completely bonkers. Yeah. So what um what Ladia came up with um was he traded once on C4 and then played bishop to D2. And so if the bishop on uh E six runs away then in theory, you know, he could make some... Oh, it did run away to e6. Uh, in some cases, he could play like knight e4, but here he goes f5. And if the bishop goes to d5, there's always knight takes d5 winning it. So he decided to just sack that piece. 
Mm -hmm. And um, I like the I like the active rooks. I mean, could White not have played Queen C three instead of King D one? I don't know, but he played King D one. So anyway, yeah. we got the position we've got. Now he's collected three pawns, four pawns. So he must be winning, right? I mean, he's super active with four pawns against a knight. That all worked like clockwork for him. Right. It's like you're worrying about your king, and I'm just worrying about your pawns. And uh, thank you. Got a good collection. You know, B3 and E5 aren't looking that healthy either. Yeah, I'm just trying to find a way for White to hold this. And, you know, this is actually becoming a very important result for Lottie. I mean, he needs to get a result here to make up for the fact that Aditya has already scored against Shankland. And, you know, there's a good chance that Shankland might only be able to draw his game against Rakesh. And so. Well, Shankland's certainly not going to win that game against Rakesh. Right. <laughs> Let's see. It's come down to the end game I was thinking of before, which I don't think has a very high chance of Sam losing. Um, it looks like he's breaking up his perfect structure. He's giving white the E6 square for the king because he's ready to start playing H4, F4, and try and sort of trade off Rakesh's pawns. Right. Um, so my guess right now is it's a draw. You know, I would come back if something different starts to happen. Yeah, so king f3 here, and yeah, I think this one's just going to stay equal. Um, let's go back to Ladia's game. He's got just seven seconds left on the clock. Oh, my God. Uh, but now, okay, so there's just a tactic. Uh, let's go back a second here. That That's leaves <clears throat> uh, Raja with a winning Rook and Pawn game. Uh, I really like what, you know, uh, what Raja did here. He realized that all of his resources was, was on the king side, but you, if you play moves like Rook f2, White's got that covered. And so what Black did was he extended the board. He brings his Rook over to a8 wow. here. Yeah. And it just leaves White's position completely in shambles. He stretched the game, and that's how, you know, right. this winning Rook and Pawn in a game was just completely reached. The so. key was Knight c3, Rook b2 mate when he went for that queen trade, which uh, Ladia may or may not have missed, right? Right. And so... Yeah, that, that's uh, that's going to be another point there for the Mumbai Movers. And that one-point yeah. deficit to start the match has now yeah. been neutralized. It's a 3-3 game in between the Mumbai Movers and the San Francisco Mechanics. Yep. They have had no trouble getting back into this match. No trouble at all. Right. So bounces of, of particular excitement. Uh, Mauricio on. Flores won. Can, oh can, yeah, our can, favorite can, game. Can, can, How we, did can this we go guy back? Win? Can we go back? Guy, what? Was checkmate. That was. What did he do? What did he do? Rook h7, king g8, rooks double, queen f6. Oh, we didn't look at that. Rook h8, queen h8, rook h8, king h8. Well, now white has got no pieces. Queen takes d7. It's two rooks and a bishop. So rook h7 was not good then. He had to play bishop f7. So rook h7 was no good. Just doubled queen f6. Jeez, man. Brutal. This really? format is so unforgiving. And you have to just feel there for, um, uh, you know, for, for Bjorn Thorfinnsson, who's playing here with the white pieces. He he pushed Renato Terry in the first round to a serious time scramble. Somehow got outplayed there in the end game. In this game, he's just completely winning against Mauricio Flores, and it's 0 for 2 for well, the we Icelandic assume he's completely winning, but we didn't, you know, we didn't find the clear knockout. Nobody else did either. Well, I think we found it, right? I mean, instead of rook h7, we were pretty content with this idea of bishop to f7 threatening rook h7. Yeah, but we didn't we didn't analyze every variation. There could have been a defense, just like there was a defense to rook h7. I mean, rook h7 was the move that we really said, okay, there's the checkmate, but we only looked at knight f6, not queen f6. I, I'm sure there were tons of possibilities after bishop f7 that we didn't really look at. So, so maybe bishop g8 was just too cute then. Maybe he had to go for this idea that we had earlier, uh, where after takes takes... Uh, where we, uh, bishop to e4, right? In this position, after knight to f4. Bishop e4 instead of, had yeah. to be just a knockout at the beginning. I I mean, I can't imagine there was any defense for black. I mean, at this point, white hasn't invested much material either. He's only down a pawn. And I didn't see, I didn't even see the next move for black here. Like, just, just finished. You're threatening bishop takes e, b7. So black has to either, I mean, they can't let you just take on b7. So they have to play, you know, some move that, at least threatens or captures a piece. Right. There's nothing, right? I mean, d5, bishop d5 resigns. Knight c6, bishop takes c6 resigns. Bishop e4, queen e4 resigns. No, I mean... And that is going to be a critical point there for the... Um, 
definitely winning at that point. Yeah. <laughs> because now it's four to two, right? And it, you're starting to get in panic mode because when you're down two points in a pro chess league matchup, that's a dangerous deficit. And you know, this is one that could have even the score instead now where you give a puffins trail by two points. Yeah, all right, let's see what's exciting. What's good? What's good? I guess maybe a DTM Ital. Yeah, I think we should focus there. That one looks like has the better chance of being decisive. The other ones look kind of equal at the moment. So let's flip back to that score where it's 3-3 three to three currently between the mechanics and the movers. All right, so Bishop on E4. Naradisky down to a minute. I think Aditya is in a little bit of trouble, though. I mean, how do you stop this king from getting into either c3 or a3? You have no dark square control. And so now the king can start to walk into c3. And the important part, I think, here for black is that you're not just going to win with these a pawns. Uh, you need oh. to create another sort of, uh, you know, threat, a.k.a. this f4 pawn, right? I mean, this, this pawn on its own will not promote on a1 with the help of the bishop. So you need to stretch out white in order to, you know, in order to get the point if you're Danya. Well, well the thing is... King f3 can be played here. If Danya played king c3, the knight on c4 is kind of keeping him away from b2. So it's a very long road down to b1, then the pawn can go to a4. Um, and in the meantime, you know, when you go to b1, there's knight d2 check. So it's hard to set everything up. So he's sacking his f pawn to get both queenside pawns. That means there are scenarios where he's only got a pawns left and a bishop that's the wrong color. So right. imagine something like king f3, bishop a2, king f4, bishop takes b3, knight e5. If the knight sacks for h7, then... Well, there still needs to be then, more done here, right? I mean, the king actually has to be, like, on a1, basically, for this exactly. to work. Exactly. Then basically, white has, like, drawing material, but the question is, do they also get their king to a1 at the same time as their knight chased down that h-pawn? Yeah. Um, that could be... That could be tricky to engineer, but it's definitely a plausible scenario right now. Right, and this pawn on um, e5 is really fast. It's what I'm looking at here, and I'm trying to figure out if, um, you know, if black doesn't, if black even needs to calculate here, right? If black can just keep his king and bishop where they are, move this pawn down the board, we know that the rook pawns are always slippery for these knights because they're the hardest to attack. You only have half the board. Right. Is he going for the a7 pawn? That can't be right. That cannot be right. And we have a result in the uh, Sam Shakelin game. That is officially a draw. A draw. Um, so Rakesh is going to get a half point in that matchup, and that does not Fantastic bode well half point. for the half San Francisco point mechanic. For the Absolutely. So let's go back to the game. I think Danya did back make his move. Where we're at. Danya plays King C5. I mean, A7 was totally the wrong direction if that was where the knight was headed. Yeah, and now, now this has to be over. Knight B8, that, B8 it's just slipping, and he's either. losing the threat. Where is he headed? Where is he going? I mean, A5 could be played even here, right? Because that gets the pawn closer to queening. Yeah. I mean, right, and then knight d7, king d6, knight f6, bishop takes b3, go to h7. Like, the a pawn is gone. Right, and I'm also worried about, like, this knight on d7. Like, is it going to be able to find an active way to get back into the game? I mean, there's a lot of different lines now where this knight could potentially get trapped, especially when it was on oh, b8. King b4. So on knight f6 or knight f8, his plan is to go bishop b1. Oh. And uh, use the bishop on the king side, king on the queen side, right? And just escort the a pawn home. It seems like... Uh, it seems like, yeah, he finally slipped. I mean, I don't know if there was any way to draw. I'm not saying that I could have yeah. <laughs> saved this game against a good opponent with my clock ticking down. But um, but definitely, I think when his knight went to e5, c6, it was going in the wrong direction. It became very clear that this was going to be a loss for white at that point. I wouldn't be surprised to see resignation now. I mean, knight d5, king b3, knight f4, a4. And, I mean, it's just not it's not happening. It's right. not happening. And, you know, for Aditya, I mean, maybe he's looking back and thinking, well, maybe I could have hold a, held a draw there. But he did his job. I mean, he's one out of two against the two 2700s. And, you know, for a 13 year old oh, yeah. kid who's like 23, 2400, I mean, that's all you can ask for from your board four. That was all he needed to do today. He needs to get one more point against the lower rated half, and then he'll be fine. Uh, yeah. In this match as well, Diptanya and Gosh has actually just beaten Andrew Hong. Um, and right. this game was close, honestly, throughout the duration of the match. Um, so but, that's uh, that's a one round for uh, Mumbai. They scored two and a half, one and a half, and now they've made up for that um, one point that they lost for the lineup change. Yeah, now if I'm San Francisco, I'm starting to sweat bullets here because every game feels like a must-win game. And, 
you know, with Shanklin not being on form and about to play even stronger players in both Raja and in Diptai and Ghosh, you're wondering where are those points coming from. So he's going to have to get in form. Naroditsky seems like he's doing fine, but you're going to have to, you know, if you're San Francisco and you're in their camp, you need to see Ladia Jurasek do something. You want to see Andrew go back to the form that he had in that first game. Look at, look at Midkov. Look at Midkov. He's down two pawns. But he's got the rook and knight in position to deliver a perpetual. And he was running his king that way as if he was hoping to give a checkmate, you know, with 10 seconds down two pawns. Right. But now it looks like it, now it looks like he decided he couldn't quite set up a checkmate. You know, if his king comes to g6, at some point, black can play a move like e5. Oh, maybe his king can't cross the fifth rank because of bishop c6 check. So that's right. why he was like, well, there's no more I can do. Right, and this is actually a really important combination between the rook, the knight, and the king. I mean, this is a very well-known drawing mechanism because the king is boxed in here, and that limits uh, black's ability to move this king. So you can't escape this perpetual if you're black because knight h7, the king will have to go to one of these two squares, and the knight will just go back, forcing that king to go back to the f8 square. If you try to get a little bit too creative here, knight h7, king g8, knight f6, king h8, rook so h8 would end leave... the game. So that just leaves Renato Terry playing again with six seconds on his clock, this time defending as opposed to uh, winning. Well, he he does have a threat here. He does have a threat. He does Knight have a six. very clear threat. One. I don't I don't think that there's enough pieces on the board for White to ever win this. I I understand that White wants to have him sort of in Sugzwang, but yeah. Right, and we have another draw there as well. So that's that's Thanks two draw. draws in the Minnesota versus Reykjavik matchup. Um, you know, as we you know as we try to you know figure out who's moving on to that quarterfinal round. Um, before we take a uh, take a quick break, let's take a look at how these teams got here and what they had to go through this summer in order to qualify for the play-in round. So here are the standings from groups A, B, C, and D. You can see that the, the, the uh, St. Louis Archbishops, Bottom Bottom Snowballs, Sao Paulo Capybaras, and Montreal Chess Bras, they all advanced to the next round on August 30th as a result of winning the group. And then on fan totals, both Chengdu and Moscow earned bids in to the August 30th round as well, leaving the Reykjavik Puffins as the second place team as the eighth seed. And even though Khan finished second in the group, unfortunately they had a conflict uh, with an event and uh, they were not able to assemble a lineup. So they deferred their playoff spot to the Minnesota Blizzard who are currently playing as Reykjavik Puffins as the seventh seed. And then there was the third place vote yesterday between the Pittsburgh Pong Grabbers, San Francisco Mechanics and the Mumbai Movers of which the Mechanics and the Movers finished first and second place respectively. Yeah, so big scores so far, 2-0 and o for um, for Deep Tie on Gosh, 2-0 and o for the Robot in the other match, 2-0 and o for Daniel Naroditsky. Yeah, a lot of 2-0s, and o, but not exactly where we thought we'd be seeing them. We definitely thought they'd be a 2-0 and o for Shankland, uh, but Gosh is really proving himself to be a super sub here um, as a result of that last second substitution. Um, yeah, I... I don't know. I mean, does that put our prediction into doubt? I mean, we both th thought that uh, San Francisco was hands down the favorite, and with that additional point, you know, it seemed like with Mumbai needing nine points to win the match, it, you know, it seemed too tall of an order. Um, I mean, I definitely think it's like a it's a tough road for Mumbai, but but it only takes like one game to sort of like turn it on its head. Really, in my opinion, I only predicted San Francisco to score nine points mm -hmm. and you know once shanklin loses to a dtm metal it's basically the whole match is a toss-up i would say right right i mean that would change my prediction to eight eight if for example i thought it was likely that shanklin would win that game yeah so so things are getting things are getting a little bit dicey there for sure uh let's take a quick look at our brackets um to see like what we predicted uh, out of this round so you had predicted both the Minnesota Blizzard and the San Francisco Mechanics were going to move on, and you can see our score predictions there, which are very highly scientific and 100% correct, right? Uh, I mean, <laughs> definitely scientific, but, uh, you know, not necessarily correct. Right. Um, so in, in your bracket, you have the Mechanics, the Bottom Bottom Snowballs, St. Louis Archbishops, and the Minnesota Blizzard advancing to the semifinals on August mm -hmm. 31st. Now, I have to ask, are you putting the San Francisco Mechanics there out of loyalty, or do you think that they're actually going to beat the Sao Paulo Capybaras? I'm very objective when I make these uh, <laughs> predictions. So, yeah, I mean, it was my best guess. I mean, yeah, that was my best guess. I think, um, well, basically, okay, so we haven't seen the Capybaras, so it's kind right. of like SF versus question mark, right? Um, 
and uh, the capybaras can be really good. And I I only put SF by one point. I think um, I think you know without knowing who's even going to play for the capybaras, like no one can really know. It's not it's not very scientific, right? It's like if I hit an object and I don't tell you what object it is with a certain amount of force, will the object break? And I don't right. tell you what the object is. I mean, how are you gonna? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, what, thing what, what are you supposed to say? But basically, I mean, I think a team that's, like, played tons of these matches and, you know, as manager, like, I know that they're going to put up a good lineup versus, like, question mark. Like, I'll go for a team that I know is, like, pretty good, right? Um, right. One thing you did say on stream yesterday was you thought that the winner of the Chengdu-St. Louis Archbishops match on August 30th will win the whole thing. So yeah. do you have Chengdu, if they were to beat St. Louis here, you think that they would beat Minnesota, yeah. who they barely beat during the semifinals, yes. and then beat yes. bottom and bottom a team that they lost to in the semifinals? Yes. Look, I mean, St. Louis won the last won the last uh, Final Four, right? Mm -hmm. They're the current PCL champions. Um, the Pandas are definitely one of the top couple teams in the league. I think most people right. would, would agree, right? I mean, they were in the Final Fours as well. Um, they got third place this year. If they happened to beat st louis this year like there's no other team in this bracket that's like better than st louis that has like an advantage and likely to beat them right yeah right. i mean here i'll show you my bracket so you know i can show you that you know i also have san francisco beating sao paulo but i actually have the chengdu pandas losing to the bottom bottom snowballs in the final i think when you just have to play that many really good teams at some point statistically your luck has to run out i mean we know that Montreal is going to be good. We know that Baden Baden is going to be good. Um, to me, like I think, I think Chengdu and St. Louis, they're right up there. I think if you could sub out St. Louis for Chengdu, and I wouldn't be disappointed. But you know, I I, I have on the other side the Baden Baden snowballs winning the whole thing, just because I think when you look at the test that it takes for them to get there, they have the easier side of the bracket, and that will make it easier for them to advance. Yeah, I mean, they've got the higher percentage chance of any team right now of winning. I would agree with that because. You know, you don't like if you had to put money on one team right now, it would be better to put it on them because Chengdu or St. Louis, like, you know, it's like a 50, almost 50 50 right in the first round, <laughs> you know? Right. So, um, so I think you'd have to put money on Bonnie and Bonnie, but I just sort of went round by round and picked the team, which, you know, in the end has the best seem to win each round. Right. Um, if we take a step back out and look at that uh, live bracket for a second. So I guess the real question that we're wondering is, you know, if we're going to guess that Sao Paulo will bring players like Krikor, Sandra Moreco, Ali Reza Perugia, and let's just assume for a second that their board four is an underrated board four, the kind of hero that we always see in the Pro Chess League. Does that change mm -hmm. your opinion about Sao Paulo? Do you see them moving on beyond not just the, the quarterfinals, but maybe even to the finals? I mean, if they've got, you know, like somebody who was like 2000 and is 2400 for board four or something like that sure they they could do anything i mean i don't think anyone knows what the what the limit is for them either yeah i oh, mean round three is underway isaac all right let's take a look so uh let's start with the san francisco mumbai match since that's like the much closer match right now uh as we're tied at 4.5 4.5 a piece now if both teams score four points uh bef between now and the end of the match the the winner will be the San Francisco mechanics because of the fan, uh, because of the higher seating and the fan vote from yesterday. Yeah. So we've got a match between two of the players who are two and zero. That means they won't both be three and zero after this round. And uh, this is Deep Tie on Gosh facing uh, Daniel Naroditsky's Kings Indian Defense, um, which you know he uh, was pretty pretty famous for during the regular season this year. For sure. And one thing that I'll be curious about Deptai and Goshir. We both remember how Farouk Amanadov just destroyed Ali Reza Farouja in a King in a Knight BD7 Kings Indian earlier this season in the yeah. Pro Chess League Summer Series. I wonder if there's maybe a little bit of prep there, uh, you know, looking up some of his own teammates' games to try to decide what he wanted to do against the Kings Indian. Yeah, I mean he's played he's played a different system from the get go, right? He's played uh he's played G three Bishop G two. Mm -hmm. Amanadov himself was the Kings Indian player from the black side. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they're, I mean, he's playing fast, so he's definitely got some prep. Danya as well, that rookie six almost looked like a pre-move. I don't know, 0.1 seconds? Could be. 
Yeah, and I, I think this is going to become like a classic bind position, right? At some point, white wants to play moves like rook c1 and f4. Make sure he's not going to drop the c4 pawn. He has like a classic C bind kind of setup. And just as I say that, of course, white's going to change the setup uh, with this move c5. Uh, but Instantly that, intense. Yeah. In, in that case, like usually black likes to play around on the dark squares. And it's a slower game. But this is going to blow things wide open. Yeah. Instantly intense. Seemingly still prep. Uh, the idea must be... D takes C5, F4, the knight's short on squares, right? And if the knight comes to D7, then E5 gets played, trying to chase away the defender of the knight on D7. Yeah, that's actually kind of right. dangerous here, and it doesn't look like Donnie would have an option, so I don't think he can afford to take on C5. That's made Donya stop and, and think. I mean, the problem yeah, is, the, uh, like, F4 is coming regardless now. If you take or don't take, there's still F4. Well, yeah, I mean, it depends a little bit what uh, what Danya does here. Because, you know, I mean, White could have played F4 last move, but it's not necessarily good. After the knight retreats to D7, sometimes you lose the pawn on E4. So right. um, you have to sort of sort of time when you, when you do it. I think the timing is pretty pretty important in that mm -hmm. um okay so well don is having a think i was thinking that the indian team looks really really well prepared this round um because you know they also had uh, a dtm mital with 15 minutes on the clock at move 10 um you know absolutely all his time he just thought for the first time in the game Mm -hmm. so he seems super well prepared and comfortable as well um so they've got two players who are basically in their home prep danya is taking the pawn after thinking for one and a half minutes and here comes f4 yeah and uh, we're gonna find out what what danya thinks he has here yeah i'm not exactly sure what the continuation is here because after, as you mentioned at d7 then e5 and you're hitting the defender of this knight at d7 knights don't usually like to protect each other without being protected by pawns because that makes it really hard for both knights to move and in this case you can't move that knight on f6 so unless Danya's planning on sacrificing on e5 and has some compensation I, i'm just not sure what the follow-up is here yeah i mean it's scary when your opponent's so confident and playing so fast um Danya has various tactical moves he could be looking at a little bit. You know, he's got he's got knight takes e4, rook d8. There there are some things in the air here. Um, you know, because white has the bishop on e3 that's not that's a little bit vulnerable as well as the pawn on e4. So this is, you know, a risky tactical operation in a certain sense from white. Right. And I'm looking around at some of the other games in this match, and I think the game between Sam Shankland and Raja Harshit has a really good um, opportunity to become explosive. I mean, we have opposite side castling already. The C file and the F file are wide open. Um, so as soon as we see what Danya has planned here, we'll go over to that game. Okay. So rook to d8, queen moves, knight d7. Yeah, so now e5 is not going to win the knight on d7. But now isn't there bishop c4 first, and then just play rook d1, and white can just say, I have full compensation for the pawn? I mean, Certainly. I Certainly like white that. can say he has compensation for the pawn, because he's getting a quick... I mean, e4, e5 is already, you know, looks like compensation for the pawn. But, I mean, concretely, though, I mean, uh, bishop c4, rook e8, and then e5, I mean, mm -hmm. where are you moving that knight? Because if you play knight e5, you're giving the pawn back, and you're just worse. Uh, okay. Well, bishop c4, the rook could go to e7 or e8. So there's that option. Um, but yeah, e5 coming. Yeah, I think bishop c4, you might have to go rook e7, right? Yeah, I think rook e7 is on, forced there. Then on e5, play knight to e8. And, uh, it certainly looks like black's on both back feet or, you know, somehow teetering on the edge of the cliff. Um, but what they want to do next is play b5 and chase all those white pieces back. So, um, so I don't, I don't know. It makes sense to me that Gosh is thinking a little bit if, if this isn't all like, you know, one long memorized computer line. Right. 
I mean, that's got to be one concern for Danya, too. He doesn't know if he's probably walked into prep or, prep or anything. Oh, yeah, I'm sure Danya knows he's in prep and is very concerned. Um... Yeah, and I, mean, I noticed that Krikor is here in the chat. I don't eat four, just like Krikor says. <laughs> That'll be the normal thing. And then, you know, if B5 retreat that bishop, sure. Right. It'll be messy. It'll be messy. And actually, Once the bishops were treated, he could try to play F6 to challenge things, maybe. Yeah. I mean, we're getting a little bit, like, far into it, and you, maybe you wanted to bounce around and see some other games, too. Yeah, let's take a look at the Sam Shanklin game, because I think it's about to, you know, get particularly explosive for both sides. Yeah, the, the center's about to blow open. The, the kings are both kind of weak. So this is an old Nimzovic idea in the advanced um, French defense. And I know this game came through a Caro, okay? But, you know, allow me to say that it looks very much like an advanced French. So okay. strategically, it's the same idea. An old Nimzovic idea to, like, not play C3 and defend the pawn on D4, not defend the base of the pawn chain. Um, but let Black take on D4, let Black's own pawns on D5 and D4 kind of lock the center closed, and then build up strength around just the E5 pawn, protecting it with pieces. Right. Um, and in that sense, having his F pawn be on the G file somehow <laughs> means that, you know, he doesn't have the, the the move F4 to defend the pawn, but he doesn't want to anyway, because F4 blocks the dark squared bishop. So it means like the F file is open for his rook. Um, yeah. So I do. That said, Sam's response looks pretty reasonable, right? Like basically, if B5 ever comes, he doesn't want his knight to get sidelined. He probably wants to trade it on E5 follow up with bishop f6 he's just trying to put everything he can into the center and say like hey like when everything goes down i shouldn't be losing after a bunch of exchanges in the center when you've sacked a pawn right and that's actually one thing that like i'm trying to figure out for white is like visually i like white's position there's a lot of opportunity but there's no concrete follow-up that puts black away and because of that that's going to make things a little bit more difficult and that story is already telling itself on the clock we already see about a minute and a half advantage in favor of Sam Shankland. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what White probably wants to do now is play B5. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's like the critical thing, and that's why I was thinking about it. I think there's, I don't think there's necessarily anything much better than that, but there could be other moves like A4 or Rook, Rook FB1 or something. But I guess it's very critical to consider B5, Knight E5, Knight E5, F E5, Bishop takes E5, and White just gets that Bishop on that great square. And then if Sam's plan is bishop f6, oh, he did something else. If Sam's plan is bishop f6, then he can, you know, take twice and get his rook to f6. Right. So white's rooks would be really good in that position. That seemed really important, but what's his idea? Maybe his idea is trade on f6 first and then play b5. But yeah. now Sam's going to want to play knight a5 and, you know, e6, e5. <laughs> well, so. instead we see this idea in knight h4, which I, which I kind of admire. I, I think one of the ideas that... Raja had there was if bishop takes f6 there was knight to e5 and now he's threatening to play knight g6 or knight f5 um, yeah. but you don't want to trade off too many pieces now like now you have to Sam's move says he just doesn't even care right he's like now I got everything in the center you could win an exchange you could win a piece and uh, my center will still be good <laughs> some kind of feeling like that right right because Sam could play I don't know. You can imagine a scenario after knight h8, rook h8. Who would you like here? Black, Yeah, right? I would like black. I mean, that's center. That's got to be after worth 90, a rook. After knight e7, knight e7, who would you like? Black. So, I don't know. All right, so here we see the move rook on h to e8. and. Okay. I don't know. I kind of like the idea of sacrificing exchange. I mean, maybe it's not the most accurate move, but because you put the but idea in my head he, there. <laughs> he didn't especially need to sack the exchange, right. right? It's like, well, what does he have to do other than move the rook off of h8, right? Um, so now bishop f5 seems to weaken the light squares for black in the center, but that bishop was also the anchor for c2 that was preventing counterplay for black. So, you know, it's... Uh, it's a little bit both ways. And I think it was actually important for White to recapture with the rook and not the pawn, because I think if G takes a five there, if we go back one move, then mm -hmm. I think Black's idea was to play this move E4 and then maybe even play knight to E5 in the future, with the idea that if, if there's ever a trade, you now have four pawns in the center, and it's just hard for White to use his rooks and Do you know what that pawn structure is called? 
two sets of doubled pawns, like <laughs> one right in front of the other? I've actually, no, I, I've actually never heard of an official term for that. I don't know a lot of names for chess things, but when I was a kid, I was told that that's called an amoeba. I like that. I'm going to start using that now. So. <laughs> and if we all use it, then that will actually be the name of it. So. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, that makes sense, though. It's kind of like its own living being there in the center if you have four pawns. In, right. in the center like that well and stuff well i mean roger's doing a good job of putting some pressure on f6 limiting what sam can do maybe knight b8 to d7 a kind of like uh rui lopez maneuver knight b8 to d7 to add some extra support to that and open the c file that might be exactly what the doctor ordered for sam here right so we see the move queen to c7 ah uh, so he's thinking of removing pressure with queen g7 yeah um also, he may have the idea of playing, like, move the knight with c2 already attacked, like pre, pre-threatened. pre Right. Whoa. Okay, so Raja wants to play h5 and, like, support that outpost. And I think that's um, actually really important, because if he, I don't think, I think if he doesn't play this move h4, then you really have to start worrying about all these h5, f5 ideas from black. So... Unless there's some sort of, sort of tactical refutation here, I actually like this idea of just supporting the entire mechanism. Yeah, I mean, I guess White's going to have to try and win somewhere, and if Sam just defends F6, I think White needs a second plan for how they win the game, right? Because right. they're weak on the queen side. I mean, Knight B8 looks looks pretty darn good to me. Um, and then just, you know, you want to play Queen C2, you're willing to play Queen C3. <laughs> like, right. Um... With, but the thing is, if black puts the knight on d7, how does white make progress? They're going to need maybe even a move like g5 themselves. Even though their king is there, the rooks and the knight on g6 give them so much power that that's where white wants to play the game. Right. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, this is... I don't know. I mean, all I know is that in this game, Sam Shanklin definitely needs to get a win here. I mean, he has to get he has to he has to turn this around. I mean, I don't think he I don't think the mechanics can win and Shanklin gets two out of four, right? I mean, there's just no way. I mean, it would require some like equally implausible thing like, you know, the mechanics board four who started out oh two suddenly scoring two out of two against the top two boards from right. India or something like that, right? Like Oh, I guess the mechanics board four will be playing their board three and four now. So it's not like Yeah, it's not like impossible. But yeah, basically, if you're if you're if you're you know board one is like much higher rated, then your boards three and four are a bit lower rated. And if that board one falls, it's very hard for the team to to pick it up. But you would basically need your board four to play like a board one somehow. It would be surprising, but it's technically possible. Right. Let's flip over to the uh, Mauricio Flores game in the Minnesota versus Reykjavik match because. Mauricio Flores has found himself in another position where his king is surrounded by a lot of holes. Uh, and mm -hmm. that usually means good things for uh, for commentary. Uh, so in that match, uh, where we currently are, the score is 5-3. to 5-3 in, uh, favor, to three in of favor of Minnesota. Minnesota. And that's actually very dangerous for Reykjavik. They need a good round this round. Three points for Minnesota would ensure that the Blizzard are moving on because they only need eight points to win, whereas Reykjavik yeah. needs a full eight and a half. So every it's point matters now. It's that point where they start to close in on, like creating very unpleasant scenarios for uh for the puffins to come back um the pawn on d6 is not long for this world so he needs to do something fast as well like not just does his team need some points in this round but he needs a good move here for white because if black plays queen d6 you can pretty much forget about winning this game right and this is you know this is a little bit of an unfortunate coordination moment for uh uh, for, for B-Man here, because if White plays the move D7 and then Queen takes D7, you'd love to be able to play this move Knight to F6. You're saying, ha, discovered attack, I'm attacking your Queen twice and I'm going to win the game. But as a result of that tactic, Knight takes F6, you protect the Queen. So the intuitive solutions yeah. that usually would exist in a position like this are just simply not there. Um, and Knight E7, King H8, you know, the pawn on D6 is still hanging because it's double attacked. And not only is it hanging, but now, like... If it goes, the knight on e7 goes. So, although there doesn't White have the move queen to d4, and the idea is that if you play knight takes knight d6, takes d4? Uh, oh knight takes d4. What am I doing? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so that's not a move. Um, the answer is he does not have that move. So he does not have it, and that's that's bad news there for uh, for White. Yeah, I'm not seeing a way for him to really even stay in this game, honestly. 
yeah. The pieces are like the pieces look active for white, and that's that's uh, you know that's misleading, right? They look very active. Black looks like he's being restricted, but in reality, it's black's pieces who are more aggressive than whites. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's time to sack an exchange. So like knight e seven, okay. king h eight, rook takes e six, f takes e six, queen d four, block on f six with you know a knight or something. Right. And then, you know, rook d1, and at least you keep your d6 pawn. I mean, I don't know. It still looks I don't rough. know if that looks... Yeah. I mean, even there, after rook d1, I mean, there's got to be a lot of ideas now where black just simply plays queen d7, brings the b rook over to either c8 or to e e8, with the idea of either sacrificing the exchange back on e7 or just playing like rook c2. I know, and my knight on e7 is is, is trapped. and Right. And whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> that 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 is the correct positional evaluation. <laughs> Bishop F three is kind of not like he's not on the same page for like an exchange sack or anything, right? He's just right. sort of like. But he might be going for it. I mean, I don't really see no, like, anything Bishop. else for him. I mean, do you? I mean, I, I, it's just not there for me. I haven't seen anything else for him. No. With the king on G seven, that exchange sack even worse because the piece on F six will be better supported. Right. Um. Uh, yeah, I just I don't know what he's what he's gonna go for here. Rook d five, then knight d six, knight f five check. G takes f five, rook d six, and at least you know triple isolated pawns aren't aren't so powerful. Right. Yeah, maybe just rook d five here. I mean, I feel like something. I think black will find something because that knight on e7 is trapped. Like, it's not going to... And by the way, Sam Shankland has just won his game. We should probably go back and take a look at that. Yeah, all right, Sam Sam needed that. San Francisco needed that. So let's see how it happened. Um, So we played queen c7, h4, rook g8, h5, and then he went for knight b8. Yeah, so he was like, he didn't want white to have that g5 pawn break. So he said, is your idea really h5? Cool, let me just make sure you do that. Good, thank you. Thank you for... We're doing that now the king side's pretty locked up now let me show you the c file and just put the knight on d7 there's kind of like nothing for uh for white to do white goes for the h6 pawn yeah and what the cost of the bishop so that's a big big commitment with that sacrifice and then this move d3 that's a nice way to finish things off i suppose sam has like every piece sort of like discoordinated and hanging here right rook right. g8 knight d7 so we shouldn't be too flippant like this could have worked out for for Raja against, you know, somebody who hadn't calculated things out very precisely. Right, and I want to go back to that moment where we played, where White played h4, and I thought like, okay, this is actually a good resource for White because it locks down the king side. The problem with this move h4 is that it opened up all of these dark squares, and I think Sam noticed that immediately, and that's why he played rook g8 instead of queen g7 because after h5, now all these dark squares just got a lot weaker, and now when we see knight b8 and this queen c3 reroute, that opens up the possibility of black to be able to play bishop d, uh, bishop to c7 in the future. It opens up the possibility of queen takes g3, and now with those pawns on h5 and g4 as opposed to h2 and g2. There's just no way to cover these dark squares, and it's going to be a point for Shankland. Yeah, so D takes C2. So he's basically winning it with that, like, sacrificed pawn on D4, you know? Right. Like, that guy becomes the hero. So, yeah, white can't let him just queen it, so white sacks the rook for it, gets queen D8 check, knight back to B8. In the end, material is completely equal, but uh, the white king's just mated on G2 or C1, depending. Right, and that's an important point there for uh, uh, for uh, Sam Shanklin because now the score is five and a half to four and a half, just like the Minnesota Blizzard. San Francisco now yeah. needs three points to win, and that's you know that's going to play a very important role going forward. Yeah, and uh, you know they the the mechanics may need Sam to be sharp when he faces Gush next round, depending how he does against Naroditsky. I mean, this guy could be could be on like three and zero when Sam has to face him. You know, and you need you need Sam to be sharp for that game. You can't just let Gosh like run through your entire team. Right. I mean, um, that was definitely not the expected result for sure. Although I'm not entirely convinced that Gosh is going to get a full point here against Naroditsky. It looks like Danya's managed to to basically get into the game. You know, but if but if this is a uh, if this is a four uh, three result position, I guess there's no such thing as a four result. So the three, I guess the fourth result would be a double forfeit. Technically, you could get zero zero. Right. Um, but if this is a three result position, since both players are here, then it is possible that Gosh could come through at uh, at three and zero. Right. Yeah, that's for sure. 
Uh, I mean, if, if I'm white, I'm a little bit worried about my king's safety, but if I'm black, I'm, you know, I'm looking at the fact my rook on d8 is fairly active, my knight and my queen are a better combination than the queen and the bishop, so definitely three mm -hmm. results possible. Uh, Probably but... a bad sign for black, though, just if you look at the last move, and if we just trust these players for a second. Mm -hmm. Like, white just threatened a queen, offered offered a queen trade, right? Right. And Naroditsky handled it as if it were a threat, right? Like, he said, like, no, I cannot trade on c5, even though I'm up a pawn, right? Queen c5, rook c5, my split pawns are so bad, the bishop is so good that, you know, with, like, bishop c4 and rook a1 to a6 coming, like, I cannot even play this endgame and play as queen b3, right? Right. So he'd rather give the a pawn for free and keep it in a middle game than um than trade queens and try and play that end game so to me that's naroditsky telling us that he does not rate highly his position well maybe maybe he thought rook a8 a2 would be good here i mean that was one thing i was looking at i mean that's something hopeful i agree that the end game is no good there for black but you know mm -hmm. i also think that black has decent winning chances here despite you know giving back a pawn he was up a pawn to begin with if this mm -hmm. knight for example were to just move out of the way from d5 it opens up the possibility for rook to d2 check this king on g2 is exposed and this queen is far from home over on a7 so while yeah i mean it's not an ideal moment to have to con you know concede that yes my end game is worse i think that you know danya did see greener pastures here i mean 97 knight f5 are ideas followed by rook d2 and it's okay. a lot easier to attack yeah. white than i think it is for white to attack black i mean this king is perfectly when you said, safe when you said if he moves his knight my mind just immediately jumped to knight f4 and i was like no knight f4 doesn't work <laughs> right, but right. Um, 87 to f5 is what you had in mind that's much more plausible but i would think rook a8 to a2 is is the approach like you don't even have right. time to play 87 you just got to get to that second rank although uh, rook a8 doesn't that give white uh queen f2 rook a2 rook e2 it does but once white does that there may be like 93 check or something right so okay we're we're seeing it Right. I guess I guess the point here is if knight e three check, then uh, king yeah. g one. You can play knight to f five. You get the same position that I was trying to get, but a move faster. I think that's important for black. Oh, okay. Rook a eight is also very good because now you're threatening rook, rook takes e two. Okay. So now you would think rook, rook c to c two, except then rook c two, rook c two, queen c two. Boom. So, so he doesn't have that. So does he play rook c to e one to be able to cover his second rank? Right, because he wants. He wants if the a2 rook trades with a new reinforcement coming in on a2, he wants his rook to be able to defend the second rank, I think. But if rook c e1, there's now knight c3, right? Because now if rook takes a2, rook takes a2 wins the game. Ugh, so that's no good neither. Yeah, I mean, it's always you always want to look, think about the combination of pieces, right? The queen and knight are better than the queen and bishop because they can hit an unusual kind of combinations of squares, whereas like the queen and bishop can only team together on 32 squares of the board. Uh, and this knight on d5, like immediately like i'm thinking regardless of you know the actual concrete evaluation here that you know black just simply has to be better and i think that that's what uh, dip diane gauche is realizing now okay so the battle of the two and o's danya looking like he survived a scary opening preparation and is looking to get active against this white king and this this could go any which way um, crazy position also in this match between Roaring Seawolf and Vinny the Pooh. We've got the Black King kind of on the run. It looks like this was the other game where uh, Mumbai had incredible preparation, right? Where Vinny the Pooh, Aditya Mittal, 13-year-old Phenom, had 15 minutes on the clock well into the game. But now, I mean, White's King is on D1, but White is a, a bishop pair, an entire yeah. bishop pair. I mean, when you brought up this game and you were saying that Black was really prepared, I'm looking at this board. It's like, where are, the, where are Black's bishops? Am I missing something? Like, is there like a board filter? Like, yeah, no, this is just this can't be good. And this is this is an important game for Mumbai. I mean, we know so that they need just, nine points. Maybe just Bishop A six, looking at Bishop B five <laughs> or even Rook C eight. And I guess I mean a bishop pair just has to count. I, it has to count for where, something. Where did where did it happen? I mean, material was equal not that long ago. Bishop takes E four. Why did he play bishop takes e4? Nobody knows. And while we were analyzing this game, we just got in two draws in the Minnesota Blizzard matchup. GM Mikov just drew Hunin, and the robot right. 72 drew Terry Luan. So that's Most one point each. important that Terry Luan stopped the robot, right? Right. Uh, but Renato, uh, you could argue that Renato Terry also got stopped there because he was also 2 0. But what that means is the score is going he to be one six. And a half. He was one and a half out of two. Ah, uh, one and a half. Okay, my bad. 
Um, but yeah. that means the score is going to be six to four now, and Minnesota only needs two points out of the remaining six games, I believe. In right. order to How's Mauricio move on. Flores doing? He's been pretty like solid for them in the past. What? Well, Mauricio Flores doesn't have a queen, and that's actually a very important point here, right? Wait, so this game, this game, which we thought was looking dire for B man. He somehow got into it. So he did play rook d5 like we thought. And on knight d6, he went for knight f5 check. And now if g takes f5 is what we had talked about, right? Gf5, rook d6. Right. And then, you know, like white's down a couple pawns, but there are tripled isolated pawns and the black king's always open. So this was actually a very fine position probably for white relatively if black played gf5. Instead, the plan was to sack the queen. And now he thinks like, look, I've got rook beautiful knight pair two pawns e3 and d4 for my knights so he's thinking this is he's playing this thinking he's got a really good position i can tell you that I'm, I'm confident that mauricio flores was confident when he traded in his queen it was nothing like desperation it was you, definitely yeah thinking things were good i mean do you still think he thinks things are good i mean this is i would be a little bit nervous right now if i were but now were i just i don't think it seems so clear it seems like very good chances of a draw is kind of my feeling like just you know, how do you keep the black king covered forever with the rook and queen both being active? You know, he wanted his b8 rook to be on d2 by the time the game got got to this point, right? Somehow right. white developed his rook on a1 before black was able to do much. Right, and I'm trying to like figure out a way. Is there maybe a way to draw this king out? Is like h5, king takes h5, queen takes f7 viable. Instead, Mauricio Flores has just offered a draw, so he clearly doesn't believe he's better anymore. Otherwise, he wouldn't be offering the draw, and I don't think he has reason to think he's better here b man um, event immediately declined it i think on h5 the king will go back into his hideout he's only come up to g6 to defend g5 right so on h5 i think he can he can he can step back and 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 hold on to things just fine um yeah something like this feels right then black doesn't have enough pieces to mate your king yeah i like it b man Right, and this is going to be an important game for Bragi Thorfinnsson because he's currently half out of two in his first two rounds against the lower-rated boards. A win here against the board one would kind of make up for lost ground. He'd be one and a half out of three, and that would put the Reykjavik Puffins within one point of the Minnesota Blizzard, which is five games left to go in the match. Ooh, and Greg Shahadi, the the uh, the commissioner of the league, has made a pretty good suggestion as well that Queen D6 instead of Rook E5 also looked good. Black couldn't block with rook e6 because of the rook on b8. And if black played pawn to f6, white can play rook c7. And they're very quickly getting a look at the black king. But maybe rook bd8 would still keep the white queen out. So anyway, he goes for the rook trade. We've um, just had a win for... Um, yeah, that was for Minnesota, and that's a dangerous win Vladimir too. Vladimir Georgiev. Whoa. And that means the score is 7-4, to four, and should Minnesota win one more game or have two draws between now and the end of the match, there's five games right. left, they win the match because of the 8-8 eight eight tiebreaker. So for Bragi, this is, this is well, this was game. must win. This is now, you have to win, uh, if, if, if there's even a difference there. Um, but yeah, Reykjavik needs a... The needs a game. We're sort of, we keep getting to games like a moment too late. Let's get one right before it's going to come down. It looks like Deep Tie and Gush is sacking the Bishop on E2. Even the rook on e1 saying like he's got to go for a perpetual, and Naraditsky just says, Yeah, queen e1, knight e2, I could calculate them, or I could just play queen d5 and you resign, right? Like, yeah. straight into the king and pawn ending. And uh, now you can just take everything on e2, it's a winning now you pawn just take game. everything on e2, right? So, I'm surprised he took the way he did. I thought he would take the two connected passers, right? I was surprised he was even thinking, honestly. I was like, is he just sitting here, like, giving the guy a chance to resign? But, but um... Well, this is actually a very poorly timed result for the Mumbai Movers because Ladia Jurasek has just beaten Rakesh Golkarni. And so Ouch. that means it's two consecutive points now okay, for the San Francisco the Mechanics. And Ladia gets on the board. He started off 0-2, so he had to keep that... I think the key... That was a 4-0 sweep, by the way, for the San Francisco Mechanics. We'll have to double-check our math, but that might be enough. I think one of the key ingredients for a board four in this league is like taking punches. Right. Because basically like, okay, there, we're seeing a balanced match between Puffins and Minnesota, which is a different story, but very often in the league, you've got some super high rated players on boards one or two. You got a board four who's going to get brutalized the first two rounds, sometimes even the first three rounds, right? right. 
you need somebody who doesn't get dispirited, right? Somebody who can lose two to three games and then just play their last games against the opponent's board three and four, like normal, right? As right. if like, as if nothing has happened, as if someone hasn't just dumped a huge like container of trash on your head, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's like, I'm just playing chess here. This is the game I'm, I'm here for, you know? Right, and with that result, by the way, with Danya Naroditsky winning, the San Francisco Mechanics could resign all four of their games. They are moving on to the next round. They will obviously try to play to, you know, boost the score and intimidate the Sao Paulo Capybaras at this point, but an 8.5, 4.5, that's good enough to win. Uh, even if the Mumbai Movers score all four points and it's an 8.5, 8.5 tie, the San Francisco Mechanics had the draw odds because they did better in yesterday's fan vote. And so the San Francisco Mechanics, they'll be moving on in our live bracket, and they so will be facing just... the Sao Paulo Capybaras. So did they just score 4-0? That, that was what a you're sweep. Me? That was a sweep. The previous round, they lose 2.5, 1.5. It feels like a gut punch. They've got that extra point. They've got that extra point. They've got the draw odds. The other team has come back. And then they go 4-0? and oh? Yeah, I mean... That's, it... really, that's really some new mental toughness for the mechanics that they haven't shown before. I'm an expert on the mechanics. Um, that's, that's really a big deal for them. Absolutely. And with this game being a draw, that's also bad news for the Reykjavik Puffins because now Minnesota only needs a half more point to, you know, be able to move on as well. But, I, you know, with regards to the San Francisco mechanics, that was a really important result because it seemed like after the end of the second round, it was slipping. I mean, Sam Shanklin was half out of two. Aditya Matal had just beaten him in the first round. Uh, Rakesh was doing well. He also drew Sam Shanklin. So it just seemed like things were going their way. Diptayan Ghosh was also having a, an incredible performance. And, and with that sweep... We now know who one of the two teams will be moving on into the August wow. 30th quarterfinal for the Pro League Summer Series Championship. All right. And uh, Daniel Nerditsky in the chat um, asking about the score. And, you know, I'm, I'm confirming to the team what the score is. And uh, he says he's going to be disciplined and play as well as he can in the last round. So he's trying to, like get that experience of playing four rounds as if every one of those four games is sort of do or die, right? Right. Yeah, and I mean, I think this is, in a, you know, this is a good opportunity for San Francisco to, like, write what happened that, you know, that was wrong in that first round and then try to come back and show Sao Paulo, like, look, all of our players are really good. And you don't even know if this is the lineup that we're bringing. I mean, San Francisco's had all sorts of different lineups. I remember when uh, San Francisco played Chengdu, uh, there was three 2600s, and they just destroyed the Chengdu Pandas in their regular season match. And they've also done really well in Battle Royale. So, you know, Sao Paulo, they're going to watch this match today, and they're going to have a lot of homework to do, um, knowing that this is going to be their matchup, knowing that they do have draw odds, and trying to figure out who that board four is. I think that that decision, single-handedly, will make or break that match. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're going to need, like like I said, right, somebody who can potentially take a blow or two, um, you know, and then, and then turn it on in the last two rounds if they need to. Right. So if I'm not mistaken here, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with the start of the next round. All right. See you guys.
Yes! Yes! Shit! Mm. Mm. Dab all the way! Dab all the way! <laughs> yes! <laughs> And that was Bigfoot streaming in Group B with a win for the Baden Baden Snowballs in their Life Club match against the Barcelona Raptors. Uh, we talked a lot early in the group stage about the Curse of Five and you know what that means. And now that we're past this playoff hurdle, we see two Curse of Five teams playing each other, San Francisco and Mumbai. Uh, Barcelona unfortunately did not make that cut. Uh, and then of course Montreal wound up smashing uh, that curse altogether, which puts us at our current bracket here that has the Montreal Chess Bras as the two seed scoring 17 points during the group stage. Yeah, they've smashed the curse and the division and, and everything. They're up there with the two seed, and uh, they're looking great. So going into this last round, which should start in any minute, we already know that one of the quarterfinal pairings will be the Sao Paulo Capybaras against the San Francisco Mechanics. The winner of the Reykjavik Puffins and Minnesota Blizzard will play the Montreal Chess Bras on August 30th. So for the first time on Championship Weekend, we'll actually have eight teams playing as opposed to four. It's going to be a really exciting format. Quarterfinals will be on the 30th. Semifinals and finals will be on the 31st. And, I mean, I'm really excited about all these matches, but if you had to only pick one yeah. to watch, which one is it going to be? <laughs> you know you know my answer already, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. It has to be, right? <laughs> I would have to watch my team play, right? No, oh. <laughs> but if I, if I were just an honest fan, a totally honest fan, it would be St. Louis and Chengdu because that's where, you know, maybe I can see Caruana or So play against, you know, the likes of Ding Li Ren or Li Chao or Yu Yang Yi. So, and I think that's going to determine the winner. So, from a certain perspective, that's the match I want to see. The best players, the most likely to win the whole thing. From the other perspective, I'd answered your previous daily question that the team I was most excited to see was Capybaras. So, you know, my my friends on the mechanics playing against the new team Capybaras from the perspective of liking to see new stuff, that's the that those are the two matches that I want to see, right? One where like the people I think are the winners are playing and the other where it's like, "Hey, is there somebody new that can, you know, step up and show something really great?" Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that those two matches are definitely the favorite. Now, I guess the question for you, right, since we're commentators, we're supposed to know everything about what happens in the upcoming Pro Chess League season. Do you do you think that the winner of the Chengdu Pandas versus the St. Louis Archbishops quarterfinal matchup will win not just the Summer Series, but the 2020 Pro Chess League title? I mean, they'll have a good chance. Let, let me, it's going to be a yes or no. <laughs> let me put it this way. I've not yet seen any reason why those two teams would not return to the final four next year now now isaac i don't even know which teams are going to be in which division for next year so it's a little a little rough to put me on the spot like for that but like i would i would currently expect both of those teams to return to the final four i would expect the team that wins this match between them to be a f small favorite i guess but i mean i can't tell you it'd be like 100 percent, right but personally right. i expect st louis to win this and to win next season if you want it like that 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 would be my call right now that they're like a slight favorite to win every season every season ever so let, let, let's let's make that a little bit more complicated then you said you're also excited to watch the sao paulo capybaras let's say the capybaras wind up winning the summer series they beat st louis they beat uh, san francisco they beat baden baden if they yeah. qualify for the pro chess league season and this falls qualifiers do you have that would you have them winning the pro chess league title in 2020 Sure. If I see a new team beat St. Louis, then then I'll turn things around, right? Then I'll then I'll say, okay, you know, anything anything can happen, and and it has happened, and now somebody has shown me that they can that they can run with and compete with St. Louis. Till that happens, I'm never going to predict it, really. <laughs> That's fair. But once it happens, sure. I think what would be funny is if they beat St. Louis, won the whole like summer season, and then like somehow didn't make it through the qualifiers. Right. I mean, and we say that. Like, what are all these qualifiers better than St. Louis? What's going on? I mean, we say that now and how that might be funny. But I mean, a lot of the teams that are applying to be in the qualifiers uh, and some of them have already been publicly released. A lot of them, we're waiting to announce them publicly. But, uh, you know, they are very competitive teams. And like Sao Paulo Capybaros is certainly a strong team. But I can tell you for a fact that it, it's no give me that they're going to actually qualify. Right. Like there's so many good teams in this year's qualifiers. Um, we already know that there are four confirmed teams, Sao Paulo, Capybaras, the Pittsburgh Pond Grabbers, Barcelona Raptors, and the Reykjavik Puffins. Uh, uh, but there's some other teams that are going to join that mix as well, and they're all going to be very competitive. Now, we do see a little bit of a litmus test here for Reykjavik. They're going to have to find a way to change their lineup, I think, 
find free agent, find that missing piece that will make them tick in the qualifiers if they want to get into the next round. Um, but I mean, there, you know, whoever wins the qualifier or whoever moves on through the qualifier, I think it's going to be immediately make a difference in the Pro Chess League. And that's one of the things I'm really excited to see. If you guys want to watch the qualifiers that will start this fall, you know, in late September and then, you know, into October over four different weeks. So it'll be really exciting to watch that play out. Now, let's talk about what, you know, how all of this summer series stuff kind of features into like the prize breakdown uh, for a second. So obviously with the live club matches that that phase of the tournament's been over so if you know you're trying to figure out how much your team won uh the first place team in each group won fifteen hundred dollars second place twelve hundred then eight fifty then six hundred which is not a bad day for fourth place um the individual players who played in the knockout battles win an additional amount um based on how they did if they're first first through third and then obviously the summer series championship where we are now um the first place team will win an additional two thousand dollars second place will win an additional one thousand and San Francisco is already guaranteed that they will win an additional $250. If Minnesota can hold through against Reykjavik, they will also uh, have a $250 prize just for winning today's matchup, uh, which means that this matchup that's happening today might actually, you know, be like one of the bigger, you know, prizes that we've ever distributed for a non-championship game in the Pro Chess League, which is really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Good prizes. So... That adds to the excitement. And, you know, personally, I love that the prizes were divided around a little bit more in the summer series where, like, you know, a team that got third or fourth place or something still got something that helps them, like, build on it, right? So, like, the teams have these chances to win these $250 more, like, every match that they play, basically. Right. Right? Or more. That means, like, every step of the way, there's some, you know, some incentive instead of just you're dreaming of that first place $20,000 prize. And if you don't make it to the finals... Like you've got nothing to hire a new free agent to retool your team for the next year. So I, um, I think uh, it's been it's been really good to have all these prizes distributed in the summer series championships. Prizes for fans too. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, prizes for the players each week based on how they do in the knockouts instead of, you know, like hoping that one of their games wins game of the week once in a season or something. Right. Um, yeah, and that's yeah. one thing that's very new, obviously, with the Summer Series uh, you know, championships is that the fans can actually win prizes in you know, the group stages. You know, we, we've, you know, we've, uh, we're, we're figuring out who we want to be the Group D best fan, uh, but the first three fans have already you know, won for their respective groups. But if you're a fan and you've just found out about the Summer Series and you want to get more involved in the Pro Chess League, there are opportunities for you if you join the Pro Chess League club on chess.com. Um, for example, if you are a member of the Pro Chess League Club and any one of your favorite team's clubs, regardless of if they're in Summer Series or not, you can help push your team in the Vote Chess, Champion, uh, Vote Chess Championship. There's a lot of matches going on right now. At the beginning of every month, we pair the next round. Uh, and you know, fans are obviously going to play a bigger role in that than the, than the actual team because it's going to be more fans, the players. Uh, I know that uh, the San Francisco Mechanics had a very heated debate about what their last move was against the, uh, I believe it was the Minnesota Blizzard. Am I right? <laughs> It was unfortunately not very <laughs> heated because some people just like didn't even know their rook was attacked or something. I guess the heated part was after we left a rook hanging to a bishop, then it got heated, right? Then suddenly right. people were like, have we been infiltrated by like, you know, people like voting for us to hang our rook? Like, you know, or do we have this many beginners on our team? Which, you know, if you've got beginners, you know, no insult. Beginners should not feel like they shouldn't vote for what they see. Like they should not participate. Everyone should participate. That's the point. Right. So I wanted to be very careful that if this was genuinely voted for by beginners, that they did not feel like shamed or insulted or like they should hold off on voting and let better players vote or something. Absolutely not. Right. And that's what the, right. And that's the blunder was so egregious that people were wondering, <laughs> like, did we get infiltrated? <laughs> Well, I mean, usually that's not the case, right? And one of the beauties about the Vote Chess Championship is that if you're a beginner player and maybe you aren't in a, in a region that's considered local to a Pro Chess League team, you can still root for a team and interact with the players on that team, and they can kind of help walk you through what you should vote for. So you're learning as you go, right? So it's a very unusual format where you know teams have an opportunity to interact with their fans more beyond the Summer Series and continue from there. Another you know thing that I know a lot of people are asking you know this time this year is how do I get ready to play in the Pro Chess League? How can I be a member? of the Pro Chess League. Well, if you're looking to warm up, one thing I would recommend is playing in our Pro Chess League weekly arenas. They're Thursdays every week at 2.30 Pacific time. Um, if you're a member of the Pro Chess League Club, it'll pop up in your tournaments tab. If you win uh, a weekly arena, you actually get a Pro Chess League card with your favorite team on it and a, a shout out on Twitter to try to help that team recruit you. Um, so that's always really exciting. And if you think that you have trained and you, you're ready to go and you can play in the 
the uh, the 2020 Pro Chess League season, then you should definitely check out the free agent application, which is linked in the club district description on the on the Pro Chess League club on chess.com. It will soon be on the cover of the Pro Chess League um, homepage on ProChessLeague.com, but the best way to find it right now is through the Chess.com club. You can submit your app and, you know, all of the teams, both in the qualifiers and in the regular season, will be uh, looking through your applications and trying to decide, are you the guy that I'm looking for? Are you the missing piece that will help me get through um, to the Pro Chess League finals? So a lot of really great things this year for fans that haven't been in the Pro Chess League before. And, you know, if you've had a lot of fun playing in the Pro Chess League Summer Series, this is definitely the way to get started. All right, so Isaac, um, we've got a tough task here for the Reykjavik Puffins. You know, as you said from the beginning, they've got something to prove. So here they are with their backs against the wall against Minnesota Blizzard, a playoff seasoned team. And uh, how many points do they need here? They're down seven and a half, four and a half. Is that right? Do they need a four and O? Oh? They need a San Francisco uh, to, to make this work out. They need to go four O. Uh, because if, it, if the match finishes 8-8, eight to eight, Minnesota moves on because they had the higher seed thanks to their fan growth that they had during Group D. So, you know, Reykjavik... So Mauricio Flores just offered a draw to the robot, and even without moving, he just, like, clicked the client, right? He knows right. he needs 4-0. Um, for some reason, those games aren't popping up on my screen. Uh, just give me a quick second. Oh, okay. Just go look for the games because they're all there, and they're, they're zipping along. And... Uh, while while you pull that up, I'll just tell everybody a four and zero is like extremely hard to get in the last round. I know of it happening one time this season where Minnesota was the team down four points and scored four zero in the last round against the San Francisco Mechanics. But uh, a four zero, so it does exist in sort of like a needed last round situation. A four zero does exist, but it's pretty it's pretty rare. Right. Um, it's most likely with balanced teams like Minnesota and like the Puffins. Um, it's most likely that you get four O's with those kind of teams where, you know, their board four is, you know, a very strong IM or a slightly low rated GM. Right. <laughs> and uh, their board one is not much over 2,500. I mean, the one thing I will say is usually when I do see four O's in the pro chess league, they almost never happen when you need them to, but when they do, it's like this incredible, you know, season changing performance, right? I, I remember a few times where I, I was the manager of the Pittsburgh Pong Grabbers and, you know, our team either got four owed or we four owed our opponent, but usually at that point it's it's the inertia, right? I mean, you know, Reykjavik has had a lot of really good positions that I think they're wishing that they had back. I, you know, obviously that game that they should have beaten Mauricio Flores in the second round with comes to mind immediately. Um, but they, you know, to go four oh that that takes not only a lot of, you know, good chess play here, it's a lot of mental toughness and Right. So let's click through the four games and see if it's plausible for the puffins to win each of the four okay so let's go real quick start with board one against board one so we got um robot against mauricio flores robot's got black here mm -hmm. and he's got a position where it's very tough for him to make a pawn break and he'll right. need a pawn break if he wants to win this eventually so Normally, this kind of position, the player playing white tries to sit on sit on black and try and squeeze it for an advantage. But if white doesn't even care about winning, um, should be should be a very tough position to win with black against a GM, unless that knight just trapped itself. Did it? As we're as we're saying, this is a position where <laughs> you know white could never lose it, and that's what you need. You need some like real shockers. But where is that knight going? Yeah, I, I mean. I, I saw that the, there was potential for this move B6, but I just assumed maybe that there was a way Flores had figured something out here. I mean, maybe he was just like, draw, 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 oh. And, and now this is where he's at. And I, I mean, he I, could I don't play, see an escape. He could play E4. He could play E4, but he'll be at minimum down a pawn after Rook takes D7. And maybe Knight F4 check won't even work out for him. Like E4, Knight F4 check, King to F3, Rook takes D7. King takes f4, knight d3, check. Then oh, he's down a pawn even and an exchange. Like, good night. Yeah. So there's one. There's, there's one. Out there's one. there's Let's one. Let's go to board two. Board Let's two. Let's go to board two. B-man against Renato Terry Lujan. 
And B-Man is taking the approach of like, I need to win this game to heart, right? He's like, I really need to win it. Let's just throw like an insane pawn at the dude. But okay, this gives a practical chance. This move castles now gives a practical chance to Black, right? This is exactly what Black wanted yeah. to see. And we saw Broggy I mean, every, do this a few times during the summer series. Every pawn was moved on the queen side, right? A3, B4, C4. So he plays Rook G8 and he's like, I don't really think you're suddenly going to try and castle queen side. But if you do, you know, I'll come hunt you there. So right. his plan is to like hunt this king wherever he goes. And obviously, I mean, I'm not saying his position's good or anything, but obviously possible to win. Let's right. try board three. So board three is going to be the matchup with Georgiev playing black. And uh, I believe this is Bjorn Thorfinnsson uh, playing right. white. Practical chances here too, right? I mean, like, I'm not going to say white is better, but you are opening up the G file. You do have the pair of bishops. I'll say white's Marcus better. Coming to they G1. The bishop pair, the dark squares are weak, and the black king's getting torn up. Yeah, actually, the more I'm looking at this, like, at first I thought, like, okay, maybe black can play moves like rook g7 in the future. But, I mean, this e5 square is going to open up for this bishop on f4. Right. This is super legit because g5 is not just opening up the king. He's trying to, like, break the last dark squared pawn, right? Like, if f6 goes to f5 to try and keep the g file closed or whatever, right. whatever, you get the e5 square for your bishop. He can't even challenge that bishop. Then you go h5, g6 at some point. By the way, it's worth noting, Mauricio Flores didn't even try to save his knight. He just went down a full knight. So... That, that's yeah. basically in the bag. So that's that means cool. we've got one game left to look at, right? The game between uh, game David Charkinson and Mitkov's doing. Mitkov. This could be the 4-0. In a sense, like, Minnesota knows it's possible because they've done it, right? Yeah. So, like, they, they have a sense of what could go wrong. It should mean that they, like, ad adapt correctly and, like, sort of know what to do. But maybe it means they're, like, afraid because they know that, you know, maybe they're worrying about it. Anyway, let's see so Mitkov. This is definitely the most balanced of the four games, but I still yeah. think White has a slight edge here now. I mean, you're going to open up the H file. This rook on H8 is weak. What is this rook on D6 doing? It's not clear. And your knight on D3 is better positioned than this knight on, on D7. The queen yeah. has all access to G3, has access to H4. Thank you scored a quick point. My goodness. All I see is a knight on e6. What the? <laughs> Let me pull up what that game really quick. I mean, he started off badly and played himself into shape. You wouldn't want to play a round five or six with him right now, I have to say. Like, if he wins in 18 moves against their board one. Right. So let's, um, let's pull up his game really quick. Yeah, um, maybe let's just see. I, I always like a little blood. I know the other match is the one that's in question, but let's go to move 13. Sam plays king f1. Oh my gosh, this ended super quick. Okay, so king f1. He's playing in that rook g8, g5 style here, right? Just throwing everything at that king. Pawn to c4. Shanky's mad. Knight g5. Okay, coming into h7. Normally g6, h5 is not the best approach. So black yeah. plays h6. Knight c to e4, just leaving that knight hanging. Sure, bishop e4, bishop e4. Oh, this God. This is bad. It's just bad. If HG, HG, it's what amateurs call the fishing pole. I don't know if that's an approved term, but I've heard a lot of amateurs call it that. I think I've just heard of it called the hook, right? I mean, this is the you idea. Just checkmate. But... So he moves the king. So bishop h7 is not mate, but it also means you can even never take on g5 because hg will be check. Right. Bishop c6, just clearing the way for his queen. g6, trying to stop the queen. Right, because he's threatening bishop d7. Queen d7, bishop f6, bishop f6, queen h7, mate. So g6, then just knight into e6. Oh, queen coming to g6. Rook g3, queen h6, bishop on b2 is open. That is just absolutely disgusting. I mean, that might be one of the fastest games that have happened so far, this Purchase League Summer Series. I mean, I didn't even have a chance to pull up that game while it was live. It was over so fast. Right. I mean, I don't think we've had a miniature in, in the playoffs here yet. Um, so, man... So nice. I always love a miniature, whichever side you're on. I mean, I just I just like that quick blood. But um, let's get back to our match. So where do you want to go? Let's take a quick look through the games again and see if anything's changed from our original assessment. We know that Mauricio Flores will likely lose this one. He's just down a pure piece. No pure yeah. compensation. Who yeah, still has this really good attack on, on the king side, right? Like Honestly, like that was the game that I would have said um was like handily you know minnesota can just make sure to draw that game and the other three can play normally right, right. like and i think that must have been the plan like, no position and as i'm explaining why he plays knight d7 so okay so this is actually an interesting like general manager situation right because you assume that your your teammates aren't watching these games as they're happening live right 
Would it right. be the practical decision for Mauricio Flores, who's supposed to be playing for this draw, to resign now so his teammates see that that game is over and he lost? Yes. I mean, I think you have to resign. I know, like, every bone in your chest, like, chest idea. body is, like, say, play on. Maybe right. you draw. Maybe he blunders. But I think right. the communication to your teammate that's nonverbal and, like, just showing that the result is over tells him, guys, right. you got to get this back together because I'm looking through these other games. I don't know where Minnesota's points are coming from at this point. I mean, we've got a no. massive kingside attack against Renato Terry, Luan. This game Nothing gets... clear yet. Mikov might be able to hold something here, but this is, like, the only promising result. Now, h pawn is loose. And then, I mean, Bjorn Thorfinsson is looking really good here um with the white pieces we've talked about how weak the dark squares are for black i mean this is this is tough this is tough yeah i think midcov's their best position right now yeah. um but i really like your idea of like hey if you don't have a way to communicate if you're not like in a chat room with like the manager updating the score for you if you're not like playing from the same chess club or something like that then Yes, you want to fight to the last pawn if you have a hope, but if you've got no hope, if you're down a piece against a robot, right? <laughs> a 2,500-plus rated robot, like, you you just resign so that they know, like, it's on them. Right. I mean... Um, and look at Midkov. Yeah. I mean, this might be the game where they do it. I mean, the most exciting game to me is the Rook G8 game. That's kind of like, I like B-Man just being like, ah! Right. Um, but... The key game as far as the match might be the most boring game, right? right. Whoever can make a draw. And now we're seeing a queen Rook out of play on B3. Queen managing to find her way over to the king side where the action is. And after the queen's trade, it's just, it's again, it's one of those unlosable positions, barring, you know, knights, knight hanging insanity. I mean, if I'm white, I mean, the, the question is going to be, how can I play on in such a way that there's still a chance for this game to be won, right? And every time that you trade these queens, this rook, as you mentioned, B3, it's out of play. Look how many moves it's going to take for this rook to get back to a normal looking square, right? So, like, we have the trade, then one, two, three, yeah. four moves, and it's move a passive rook. Play, the move I want to play is knight e5. Yeah. Then on queen takes queen, I can play g takes f3, keep the black knight at bay, put my knight on an outpost. But then I had to check if the h pawn doesn't just queen, right? Queen f3, g f3, h4, rook d3, h3, rook d1, h2. Okay, so he could perhaps play it, but there might be some move for black with, you know, knight e4, f4, rook g6 or something, and you just lose somehow. I mean, or rook f6. Yeah, so. I mean, it's definitely precarious but i mean okay if you're white in this position back here where he plays them of queen g4 i mean if you have to play for a win right like you're not playing the best moves yeah. you have to play for a win yeah. that might be your best shot right because yeah. if you can win that h pawn in that end game you you have winning chances right i mean you got to keep something on and it feels like if you retreat queen the queen f1 to not allow queen d1 and not allow queen g2 but now 94 comes black, in if black plays 94 you're like reduced to king d2 rook f6 I think you can calculate like that you're just basically losing. Right, and it looks like he's so, made up. He played queen f1. He's done it. He's done it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if you wanted to keep the queens on the board, that seemed like the square to go to, but this should just, just end him. I mean, on rook f6, he'll have knight f4. It's going to go on for a moment or two, but it feels like it feels like losing. Yeah, and that's really bad timing for Reykjavik because, I mean, they're just coming into their stride in the other three games, and... I mean, if they lose this, it's over, right? I mean, like, there's, they have to go 4-0, and so... It's crazy the Shanklin game's been done for, like, you know, five to ten minutes, and every other game is still just... You know, some of them are in the opening. Like, they're just right. playing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just to remind everybody, with the higher seeding Minnesota, again, a single draw will move them through to the next round. 8-8 uh, eight, eight to eight is good enough for Minnesota, and that's why we're putting so much pressure on Reykjavik to go 4-0 here. That's, that's what they need to stay alive in this tournament. Uh, okay, we said that Flores had no hope, but does he? How many pawns has he won back here? He just took uh, two pawns in a row. He just played knight takes e five. That's like that's, that's brutal. If king takes rook c five, and then king d six rook c to c four, but then knight c six. Maybe that's what he should have done. Why does he just let him like take everything? Yeah, and that's just not good timing at all for the. Um... For the uh, Reykjavik Puffins, because they now need to rewin this game, and I'm looking around at all of the boards here, and I mean, it looks like uh, Vladimir Georgiev is coming back. It looks like Renato Tari Luhan might be able to defend, but yeah, we're just in a really 
you know, tough spot if you're Reykjavik here. Let's take a look at that bracket again. So then that way we can kind of see what's at stake here for the Reykjavik Puffins if they were able to win. So this is the live bracket right now. And if Reykjavik were able to somehow get a 4-0 score against the Minnesota Blizzard, they would play up against the Montreal Chess Bras. And you would have to think that... Um, you know, Reykjavik at that point on would be an even bigger underdog against Montreal than they would against Minnesota. Uh, toss up, I would say. I mean, you know, in my bracket, I've got Minnesota beating, uh, beating chess bras. So I would say anything could happen. Um, let's see, since the live server's down, should I take this phone call from Sam Shankland? <laughs> Are you going to take hey. it on air? <laughs> hey, Sam, you're live on air. What's up? You did win the match, yes. Yeah. Job well done. <laughs> Other than hanging um, Bishop E4, everything's fine? Yeah, I mean, I was, I don't know. at that point, I, I, I was probably completely winning, and by the time I was blundering Bishop E4, I think he was fine anyway, so I misplayed it before that, but... I think starting in game three and four when I was kind of awake and the tee had kicked in, I played all right. Yeah, yeah, it did seem like there was a different gear there. Yeah. Okay, uh, cool. just want to make sure we're on the same page. So it sounds like we won the match and that's good news, yeah? Yes, I will follow up with information about the next match. Okay, sounds good. All right, take care. Good job. Surprisingly, right. that's the second time we've had a phone call taken during the Pro Chess League Summer Series. On, Not on our normal feed, way, right? but I figure it's like, you know, our closest thing to like a, a player interview here with the server down, what else, right? Right. I don't know. Yeah, for sure. Now, I noticed that uh, you're... You can yell at me later if you don't like that. <laughs> so, I noticed that you did say that uh, you thought that the, the difference between Montreal and Reykjavik is about the same as uh, Minnesota and Reykjavik. Uh, yeah. I'm curious about what you think there. I mean, when I... You know, I managed uh, two matches against Montreal. I, when I managed the Pittsburgh Pawn Grabbers, we went one and one against them. We won in 2018 and then got mm -hmm. obliterated in 2019. Um, I don't know. To me, when Montreal brings their top three lineup, when it's like Sarge, Hansen, Van Kampen, and then mm -hmm. some 2000 rated board four, I think if yeah. they could actually have that lineup every week during the season, nobody can, nobody can play with them. No team at all? I think no team at all. I mean, like, they... What? They beat even, even Caruana and Wesley So, the champions? They beat that team, remember? They beat them. I know they did, but Caruana hung a piece against Saric. They I mean, won by these one things point. happen in the Pro Chess League, right? That's why these games have to be played. And that's why, they, like, I do happen, but, you know. I mean, I not have. Every, not every time. I have Montreal beating either Minnesota or Reykjavik in my bracket, if we pull that up for a second. Because I just uh -huh. think, like, when you have, like, that strong of a caliber. I mean, it's not 2018 anymore where three 2600s is good enough. You need three, like, 2700s or two 2700s and a 2600 uh, to really separate yourself from one of these balanced lineups. I mean, yeah, I was going to say, three 2700s is not legal. That's man. not legal, but two, two 2700s and a 2550, I believe, is, like, on the cusp, right? If they're all local. Right, right. And that's what, you know, that's what St. Louis has, and that's basically what Montreal has as well. And so, like, you know, that was one thing that I had to adjust to, you know, when I was managing yeah. these teams between 2018 and 2019 was, you know, when you play a balanced lineup like Minnesota has or, like, some of these other teams like a um, like a Reykjavik Puffins or a Mumbai Movers kind of right. team, you're going to be weak, you know, against these teams, right? Like, your board four has to be proven. Uh, and that's why, yeah. in my mind, like, I've just got Montreal Chess Bras moving on to the semifinals because they've just got such a tong strong top three. Now, if they yeah, bring but their... Isaac, but Isaac, the thing is, the thing is, yes, you know, Van Kampen and Sarge are, and Hansen are good, but, like, Sarge is 2,700 level. The other guys are really, you know, 2,650 level at most in the Pro Chess League. They haven't performed 2,700 before, right? And the thing is also that Car 1 is not just, like, a 2,700, right? Did you, like, look at Caruana in the regular season and look at Caruana in the final four once he came to San Francisco and was playing the against the best other teams with everything on the line? There was another gear there to Caruana, right? To me, it was like in the regular season, he's like, yeah, 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 we're coasting to the playoffs. You saw him at the final four. Like, you cannot compete with that, man. You cannot. I mean, I he think... was on you, another level there. But I think you and I watched a different Ivan Saric play yesterday. I mean, he went completely undefeated. He beat Jan Ludwig Hammer. He beat uh, Andrew Tang three times in a row, mind you. I mean, yeah. he... he, he 
I he's mean, gonna be fine. Kenny is good, but he's not. He's not Fabiano Caruana, man. He's not Wesley So. It's right, not, but that's the not, difference, right? That's the difference between Montreal and Minnesota, right? That's that's where the discussion is. And I think that Montreal, if they bring that top three lineup, they are consistent on the same level as Chengdu, St. Louis, you know, and all of the other top seed teams that we're, we've come to know, come and know. And that's why it's so surprising they haven't made the playoffs in the last two years. They've got the players; they just don't have the lineup. Right. I mean, the thing is, so basically the way like a balanced lineup, and I agree with you that a stacked lineup should normally win against a balanced lineup, but Minnesota's like disproved that a bunch of times. So first of all, they like 4-0 your board four, right? Okay. So now you've got your big three against them, right? They they need to get four points out of 12 against your big three. They can, they can play for draws. They get an upset here or there. They like make the game last a long time. They get you low on time. Some of them are good in speed chess. Like... Uh, they make it really close, man. It's it's really tough. I mean, I, I hear you there, but I mean, when when you're managing against these teams like a St. Louis, right? It used to be in 2018. The reason why St. Louis almost didn't make the playoffs that year was when you have a board four who goes over four, it nullifies a four zero result from your top board. And St. Louis didn't have the lineup that could make up for it. They were basically, even though Caruana was on the lineup, it was all about Verusha Nakobe and Alejandro Ramirez, and that's why Pittsburgh, Minnesota, and Webster all got results against uh, St. Louis back in 2018. But then 2019. Yeah. Your board four can go 0 for 4 if you've got Carwan and Wesley getting both three, and then you've got like a Verusha Nakobian type player on board three getting two and a half. That's eight and a half right there, assuming your right. board four just doesn't show up to the match. And so right. that's where the balance that lineup. That's kind of how changed. they were skating through during the regular season, right? Mm -hmm. But in the finals, it was like 4 and 0 form Carwana, right? And if you get 4 and 0 Carwana and maybe like, you know, three and a half Wesley, like you don't even need that much of a board three. Yeah, I mean, that's true, too. I mean, we you know we saw that several times during the regular season as well, where St. Louis used a lineup where it was just Carwater or just so on board one, and then two 2600s, and then Julian Proleko uh, kind of player. But I think that when you have this you know top-heavy three, I think that that just is a clear advantage. We saw Minnesota lose to St. Louis 10-6 in the 2018 quarterfinals to go to the live finals. We also saw St. Louis yeah. just completely obliterate a balanced Montclair in the first three rounds, and even though Montclair was able to come back and pad the score, the game was already over. Right. And so, you know, I don't know. I mean, to me, Montreal, if they bring their best lineup every week and they haven't been able to do it, and that's why they got really good. That's why they missed the playoffs last year. They are immediately a title contender, just like they were in 2017. Yeah. Yep. 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 So we were. So do you know if we're going to be able to get the games like back to the positions they were or what's going to happen with those games? So Isaac? from. What I understand, there's currently a lot of work being done on the server, so that's obviously priority number one. Um, okay. And then we'll proceed from there. So okay. I know that Greg Shahadi's in the chat. I'm sure he's also talking with Nick about you know the right way to proceed and go from there. Um, but you know, I you know here I'll pull up the rules here while we've got okay. you know while we've it got looks this. like they think they can actually reset the positions and times to the situation they were in before. It should be possible, from what I understand. I mean, all it the players would be like are here. jarring for Minnesota if they felt like they just like clinched the match, like their <laughs> positions had just turned, and then it's like, oh, we just replay the whole round. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that that doesn't yeah. that doesn't happen. But this is like one of those act of God scenarios in the. Um, uh -huh. in, in, in the Pro Chess League rulebook, where, where it you're not going to have a rule on that, though. <laughs> um, the rule will be like you do what you can with the stuff that's flying off of the fan, right? And like just figure something out. That's yeah. what I'll say. I mean, <laughs> whatever I, you want. If I'm not mistaken, and you know, from what I under understand, like the only thing that a server outage actually does to affect the Pro Chess League rules is that. Like, if a player is not able to join the match because of a server outage, that's a different story, right? Um, but that's clearly not the question, right? It's just a server outage here that's, you know, resulted in the matches being temporarily stopped. And so um, I believe the positions and the times get restored because all the players are in Zoom. They are waiting. They are, you know, talking with us to make sure that everything is, you know, going smoothly. So I don't think that that should be an issue there at all. Okay. So... I think what we're going to do, we have one more clip that, you know, we, we thought was kind of fun from the uh, Pro Chess League Summer Series group stage. So we're going to go through that. Uh, maybe you guys remember this moment. This is the moment where we thought Norway was going to advance to, the, uh, to advance to the quarterfinals and, you know, just destroy everyone. It was this moment right here when Hammer uh, gets past, um, True. Hammer yeah. gets past uh, uh, Andrew oh, Tang. Oh, he's got a perpetual. He's, he's got a perpetual. He He'll draw it. odds and bullet, man. Wow, how did you find a perpetual on bullet with four seconds on the clock, big fella? No, he didn't. Oh, yes, he man. Did. Yes, he did. Draw. 
That was unreal. I mean, these pawns were coming down too, right? Like he, he was pretty much out of time there. Yeah, he was out of time. Hammer, hammer takes it. He played that whole game on like four seconds, starting from move ten. So you were there in that moment, right? You were doing commentary with James Canty. This is three weeks yes, ago. I think, I think you saw that I was there. <laughs> the evidence is there. I mean, how shocked were you that L Ludwig Hammer was able to go from winning the rapid game, not able to convert, having to settle for a draw, going to a bullet tiebreak against Mr. Bullet himself, and then right. somehow managed to get that perpetual to advance in the knockout battle? Um, I mean... I was I was shocked like from early on in this game I was like this is a game that like white will win. Sometimes you know like a game's going in a direction you're like there's just it's, it can only go one way, right? Right. And we we asked Tang about it later and he said the same thing. He's like I was like 100% sure I win, would win this game. If there weren't an increment, I would 100% win this game. Like how, how could this how could this, you know, not be a win for white? Right. Yeah, and, you know, I think that was a really interesting moment, right? Because you and I, we both watched that moment. You were obviously commentating. I was, you know, watching it uh, remotely. But, you know, we both saw that as the moment where this is the Norway team that's going to win the Pro Chess League Summer Series Championship. You know, everyone was predicting them to win the whole thing. They get three points in that knockout battle alone. And then they only score two points for the remainders of the Summer Series. How shocked were you that Norway, the team that was in the 2017 finals, the team that, you know, nearly made it to the live finals this past year, didn't even make it out of the group stage in this year's summer series. I mean, I hate to talk about this in front of my in front of my friend Jan Ludwig, you know, because I know like how like how like painful it is. You know, I've I've been in his shoes before, so I almost don't even want to like say it, but it's my job. So I, w I was tremendously shocked, tremendously, you know, disappointed, you know, by by empathy for them. Um, you know, I expected him to really score fantastically in those knockouts. Um, I expected his like huge fan club to turn out and, and, you know, win most of their matches. And, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think it was a very sad stream for them yesterday during their last match. Yeah, I think that it was definitely like that moment of realization where it's like, oh my goodness, we're not going to make it because they needed to beat Khan that morning. And I think we all on paper thought that uh, that Norway had the fans to beat a, a team like Khan, um, but it just never happened, right? And By the time we got to week three, I, I predicted Khan. As you may remember, I right. predicted every single game correctly yesterday, every single board of every single live club match, every single point. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you'd, a if you'd asked me that before before the group started i would have never thought Khan could finish in second place you know they had the smallest fan club by far but like the percentage of their fans who turned up to play every day was high and like the enthusiasm and energy they put into their games was really high right and that really made a difference i think in the group stage of this tournament we look at the teams that advanced and you know more often than not teams that invested time and you know their grassroots efforts to bring forth fans to you know be able to play in the match uh, those are the teams that did better. I mean, Reykjavik stands out to me as like the team that probably did one of the best jobs of their like grassroots recruiting. Minnesota did relatively well as well, even though they had fewer points because of their knockout battle performances. And then obviously Moscow is one of the like the best fan club performers of the summer. Yeah, I mean, if you put if if you wanted to take like the best fan clubs and pit them against each other. I think everyone would have to be scared of Moscow, right? Because they set the like record for most points scored. Right. But you know, if 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 people were game for this, I think it'd be really fun to like organize like one or two like live club matches that aren't part of the summer series, but just like unofficial, like pit like you know Reykjavik, which went three zero in live club matches, Chengdu, which went three zero in live club matches, the Wizards who went three zero in live club matches and then the chess bras. I would love to yeah. see some like live club matches between any of those four teams just offhand so that I could know like which club was just absolutely the sickest. Right, and I remember doing commentary with you that day when Sao Paulo played the Moscow Wizards in the Group C opener, and we were looking at the fan growth, and you know we thought Sao Paulo would win the group handily. They've got all of these fans, like over a thousand fans at that point, and Moscow only had about four or 500, but they really showed up, and you know I don't think either of us predicted not only that Moscow would win, but they would win like 79.5 to 28.5 in that kind of a fashion. Um, I mean, how do you think these results carry over into the, into the, um, into the playoff? I mean, Moscow obviously has a lot of momentum, just like Mont Montreal, but now that has to transfer from the fans to the players. And how do you think that that plays into the bracket? I think it kind of makes things like 
totally change. I think that momentum to some extent just sort of like stays in the regular season and then you get into the playoffs and it's like, you know, you turn a page. There may be some fans, uh, there may be some players who are super pumped to have the fans and where they have like that extra bit of motivation now that they felt that engagement with their own fans. Mm -hmm. I could see that being like in, like a little bit inspiring to most of these players, but, but most of them are also professionals where they kind of like bring their best game every time they play to some extent or, or you know, try to. So, um, so I think to some extent it's going to feel more like, you know, the playoffs that we saw in the, in the, in the regular PCL season, it's not going to be too much affected by, you know, the live club matches in the summer series that, that preceded this. Right. So I am, I am getting word that the, the Sinkfield cup is going to move over to the chess channel and that um, we will conclude the Minnesota versus Reykjavik match and the San Francisco versus Mumbai match uh, off stream, uh, but we will have off full stream. reports for those for you. Unfortunately, the server is just not giving us enough time to, you know, to be able to fix the, you know, fix the coverage in time before the start of the Sinkfield Cup. So we are going to make way for them, but definitely stay here on the channel. Daniel Wrench, I see he's already in the in the chat as as well as uh, some of the other rare and to go. Uh, Can't top. wait to see another six draws. Well, almost, right? I mean, Nepo at <laughs> the end of Dallas. yesterday was, you know, that was that was something special, right? B five check. Yeah. So that will do it for our coverage. Uh, we will we will be back on August thirtieth uh, with our quarterfinals. So eight teams will progress. We know that San Francisco has already punched their ticket. Minnesota is on the cusp. That will be released publicly after the match is over. Uh, but obviously, mark your calendars for that St. Louis Archbishops versus Chengdu Pandas matchup. I think we're all really looking forward to that one absolutely see you guys then see enjoy guys the same field